with our workshop today, August 3rd. Um, before we jump into the agenda, I think we, uh, Barry, I would like to get a little bit of an update on what the, uh, our, uh, our planning group or emergency group uh, is talking about uh, with respect to uh, COVID and pandemic, and then also maybe talk about the August 10th meeting that was uh, previously scheduled to be in back at the courthouse and, the August, and going forward, obviously the August 24th meeting. Uh, and if we decided to move both of those back, what that would mean and what action we need to take. So go ahead, Barry. Sure, good morning, commissioners. Um, last uh, Tuesday, I called for a um, executive policy team meeting to get an update from Dr. Jameson and Dr. Um, Cho regarding the impact COVID and specifically the Delta variants having on our community. You know, we, we started seeing an uptick. This is nothing that you haven't read about in the news that is occurring both here in Florida um, and nationally. Uh, but the results were surprising. Uh, we're, as of last week, we're doing more testing to some, uh, than, than we ever have. Um, 3,200 uh, tests, I believe. The, um, back there, the rate was, over, was about 14% which translated to about 600, or I'm sorry, 400 new cases a day. This morning we had another call and we're seeing the case count increase to almost six, or around 600. Or was it just over 600 cases a day? And on about 15% percent positivity. Um, the, the issue is that, you know, it's, it's, it's spreading very rapidly. Um, and it is the vast majority is in the unvaccinated population, um, and it's it is impacting our hospital and our healthcare system. On our ambulance transports, they're waiting up in one case three hours to be able to offload a patient. In most cases, it's delayed. Um, you have had hospitals that are overwhelmed that simply won't take more COVID. Uh, positive patients and they're making them test in the ambulance and have the tests clear before they'll bring them into the ER. These are real life situations. Those are just a few. I've asked that both Dr. Jameson and uh, Dr. Cho come next week. We're going to bring them in virtually um, and give you a real live update um, and let you ask questions of them that can be more specific than, than what I'm uh, saying here today. But the message was, is really about it is impacting our healthcare system, it is impacting our community, and the majority is, and we have a solution. We have a solution in the vaccine, um, you know, and we've got the governor um, promoting get your shot. We've got leaders from around the community getting their shot, and we've got hospitals showing real live examples of people that are in the ER without underlying health conditions that are 35 year olds wishing they had got the shot. Um, and so we're really trying to promote that and, and, and encourage people. Uh, the vaccine is available, it's readily available, and, and encourage people to, if they have questions, see their doctor, uh, but certainly if they're able, get, get the vaccine. Uh, that is our only way out of this, um, but it, it's, it's having a significant impact in our community right now. Barry, on that front, um, what, what are we uh, doing proactively on, in terms of having the vaccine uh, being taken into some of our communities around, around the county? Uh, so they're still doing point? vaccine clinics um, and in different areas. Um, and so they're, they'll continue to um, spread that. Um, they're, uh, I think there's probably more that we can do. So I've asked for how, how do we incentivize people? I mean, the, the real issue is we plateaued. Um, we can we can have you know we can set up on Friday night on Beach Drive. The question will will anybody you know get the shot? And 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 I'm I'm asking our team to how do we move that needle? Um, and it's not us trying to mandate or anything. It's it's uh, how to get correct information out there that this is safe and that you know we have an option here to help us get through this. So. Um, that is something that they're working on. We're going to continue to uh, uh, find all avenues and influencers and groups that can really talk to it that is not government. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's been the challenge. It continues to be a challenge. Uh, and we're, we're certainly we're willing to do whatever we can do to help move that needle. 
Um, hospitals themselves are, are reporting numbers now. Are they reporting numbers between each other? How are we accumulating the numbers on the cases that are coming in that are vaccinated versus non vaccinated I know you can't ask the question, but apparently, is there a way that we're tracking this information? I mean, in terms of messaging to people who haven't been vaccinated. Well, there, if, if Florida message? has more information, she can certainly come up to the podium. She's actually on the call, the hospital CEO call that we have. Um, but the case count is 660 cases a day. Okay, it's um, highest we've ever been. Um, I, I can't recall a day last summer where it was higher, but it, it, it was it's around the same number. Um, but again, you know, 95 plus percent is yeah. unvaccinated. Yes, yeah, so like Barry said, it's Lourdes Benedict, Assistant County Administrator. So like Barry said, it is 660 cases now um, on a seven-day uh, rolling um, count, which is the highest it's been. Um, if you recall, just a couple weeks ago, we were at 2.5%, um, and we were all happy about that, right? And shortly after that, then it was 7, then it was 11, then it was 14, and now it's um, 15. So um, every week it's climbing up. Um, we, we are doing, the Department of Health is doing some community events. They've never stopped that, um, going out into the different neighborhoods um, and different areas doing um, vaccines. And also the Foundation for a Healthy St. Pete is doing what we call the Red Wagon campaign. Um, they are going door to door with nurses to provide shots for people. Um, and they're also working on a campaign, like Barry said, uh, regarding um, influencers in the community, so they're not hearing it just from government. Um, so that's a campaign that's happening right now. Um, we are meeting with the hospitals, have had a couple calls already with hospitals. We have another one this afternoon at four uh, regarding the concern um, of ambulances and, and wait times. Um, it's, it's never been this high. Um, typically our ambulance does a great job within 98% uh, of the time. Patients are dropped off uh, within 15 minutes. And as you heard Barry say, now it's uh, one hour. We had a patient for uh, three hours. So not acceptable, um, and it's uh, something we're working on with the hospitals. And then, the, and then those that are coming in with issues, um, the demographics of those folks and, and the seriousness of, of the cases. Or do we have any kind of summaries that we're, we're starting to hear from the hospitals? Uh, yeah, they're definitely younger, okay. um, Commissioner, um, between 20, 35 years old, 40, 50 year old. Um, it is not the older population like we first saw. Um, nursing homes are doing okay, even though there's an uptick also um, there. I know recently there was about seven patients that were transported from the nursing homes, but it's not the crisis that we saw when this first started. And again, you have to remember um, they were vaccinated, right? Over 85% of those folks were vaccinated um, in that population. Um, okay, right. thank you. Um, yeah, just obviously this is something, the nursing home is something we got to keep a real close eye on, um, but it sounds like- And uh, Dr. With, Cho is. Yeah, with, a few, yeah. with that exception that we're, we're doing okay there. Um, and then, and then I think it's just really important that we get that information um, from our hospitals succinctly, accurately, so that we can tell the story that, it, that it in, in itself might be re reason for folks to reconsider. Um, but again, you know, telling that story to, is, is, is openly and truthfully as we can within HIPAA uh, standards or whatever that is. So you know what I mean? And we just need to be able to tell that story. Because I, I really do think we started to see a little uptick in the vaccines. At least we've seen that numbers. At least I've seen them on um, pu publicly, but not to the extent that we need them. So, um, And that, I think that's going to be the, the piece. It's, it's those stories as they continue to get out. It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's a family member. It's a friend. Um, we all have family members or friends that don't haven't taken it seriously. I mean, you know, um, family of mine, they, you know, I, I, it's not that big a deal. I'm healthy, I, I'm, you know, I'll be okay. Well, now they're starting to see their friends end up, you know, in the ER. That's probably going to be more effective than anything that we can say. And um, unfortunately, that takes time for that to penetrate. But uh, that, those are the stories that, you know, need to get out in the community. And we've talked to the hospitals about doing more of that to the extent they can, because uh, we, have an, we have an option here. You know, when we were talking about 
other options last year, we didn't have a vaccine. We didn't have a cure to this. And, you know, we're seeing it. Our nursing homes aren't overrun. We don't have, remember when we lined up ambulances to evacuate our nursing homes? Never seen anything like that in our life. That was real. It, the problem was real and, and we didn't have a solution. We have a solution now. So it's, we're not talking about mandates. We're talking about um, taking the solution and trying to curb the spread of this. And so, you know, that's where we're at. They, you know, yes, if you have the shot, they, there's some that will end up getting it anyway. It doesn't, didn't say 100%. I have a family member, they're vaccinated, but guess what? They were able to self-quarantine at home without major health issues um, as a result because they were vaccinated. They probably would have been to, ended up in the ER had they not been. And so we have a solution there. So let's stay focused around encouraging the vaccine and move those numbers. Yeah, I, yeah. again, I think the, the three stories are if you've been vaccinated um, and people you hear about from time to time have gotten pot tested positive from it, but the, the symptoms seem less or minor. At Sore least. throat, the, headache, yeah. fever. Yeah. And so, so that's a story to tell. There's a second story to tell is the, the overwhelmingness of our hospital systems. That's a second, a separate story to tell. And the third story to tell is as things unfold, those who are coming into the hospital, the age group and the seriousness of what they're getting. I don't want to mix all of these stories to say, listen, you need to go get a vaccine because we're being overwhelmed at the hospital. That's part of it. But you need to go get a vaccine because of people that aren't getting it are having a lot more difficulties. If that's true, then we need to be telling that story for our residents' sake. Yeah, and, so. and I can tell you it is true from being on, on these hospital calls, not only here, um, but on calls from across the country with doctors, it, it, that is the case. Okay. It's the unvaccinated. Um, and also the numbers at John Hopkins All Children's has also increased, which is a huge concern, especially with school starting. So, you know, please encourage folks right. to get their vaccine. It's, it's, it's yeah. the only way out of this right yeah. now. Yeah, thanks, Lourdes. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What are our vaccination rates right now? I mean, back when we were doing the calls, we'd get, a, we'd get an update of X percent over 65 X percent over 18, those kind of numbers. Do we do we have an accurate number anymore on that? Lourdes, do you have an updated number on that? Um, so the state just put out, um, or actually it was the CDC, we now have that, we can send you the link. Um, I just got it last night actually from Dr. Cho on some of those figures. Um, 12 and, and up, uh, we're at 63.9 percent. That's of as of this morning's call. Uh, 65 and up, we're at 85.5 percent um, with at least one vaccine. And that's Pinellas County. Yes. It's, it's pretty good. Well, that 63 is much better than we were not it, that long ago. So yeah, we kind of plat we kind of plateaued when we stopped reporting um, at about 50. I think it was 53 or 54 percent. Yeah. So it looks like they have moved up some. And then I've lost track of what the the state has done as far as policies, but we have two residential, uh, I guess three residential universities in Pinellas County. Um, I don't know, and two of those are private, one's public. And I don't know if the state is mandating or mandating that we can't, or the, the universities can't mandate, not us. but. Um, but with those are that seems to be the spots if we're targeting that younger audience. You talked about Beach Drive, USF St. Petersburg has three <coughs> residential facilities on campus. Mm -hmm. uh, those would be seem to be the spots where we can make some inroads. But I guess I would look around the country and see where I saw this morning, um, and I, I forget which state had reported that they were at 80% vaccination rate. And so we need to look at some of these other states and what they're doing or if they have a similar population and those kind of things. But um, appreciate the update. Uh, and Lourdes, do we have any studies on, on the folks that, um, I think you were just t talking about it, but the folks that, um, that have not been vaccinated or have been vaccinated, whatever, but there's folks that have actually gotten uh, COVID um, over time, early on or over time. Have we gotten any recent studies, and maybe this is what Dr. Cho can talk about, about their immunity the, the, that they've built up, and what does that 63% number move to from the standpoint of those that have been vaccinated and those that have been actually had the disease, COVID, 
and have some antibodies. And, and mm -hmm. can we have some discussion about that? I don't mean necessarily right now, but uh, I'd just like to know if that number, if we're talking 10% of our population as an estimate or, you know, what, where is that landing? Uh, I think that's an important component that we need to at least understand. Yeah, and Dr. Cho has asked the hospitals um, to provide that type of information as far as if they came in, if they were COVID, if they were vaccinated previously. Um, there's about four questions he's asked them um, because, you know, that data, we, we stopped getting it. Yeah. Um, I, I think you may know that. Yeah. So he just asked for that information. And just anecdotally on the call, it was about 20% of the folks in the hospital um, had been vaccinated. Um, you know, we're not seeing a lot of ICU folks. So right. again, the vaccine um, is working uh, for that. But I think your your question, commissioners, people that have gotten COVID before and the immunity yeah. buildup as yep. a result. And we've talked to Dr. Cho about that. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's gonna be different almost in every case, depends on severity, the dosage. Um, viral so he, load. Yeah, viral load. So he can't tell you if it's one month or six months or anything in between because it's um, it, the only way they do that is through testing to see if they still have antibodies. Um, uh, but uh, but that I, he yeah, can answer that. Yeah, I think there, there was a couple of studies that we've seen, one out of John Hopkins that was talking about it. But maybe that's something that we need to uh, try to address a little bit that to those folks that don't necessarily want to get vaccines, maybe they could at least get their, themselves tested for the antibodies and because right. that may be something that they're relying on um, and and in yeah. some cases it may be fine I, I you know I don't know that yeah. but may I just maybe we could have some him address that we can uh, ask dr. Joe more about well. that yeah. thank you we'll leave Anybody? that for the doctor <laughs> yes yeah 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 thanks Lourdes yeah Commissioner Long thank you mr. chair uh, I'm curious Barry if you know what the Pinellas County school system is going to be doing as they get ready to bring their kids back to school? We had the schools on this morning. They did not um, indicate, and I haven't talked to Dr. Greco um, regarding that. Um, obviously, you know the governor's action um, regarding um, masks. I think school districts are trying to figure out what the um, governor's actions do in terms of limiting their options. Okay, well, I, you know, I've been listening very carefully to the discussion and, and hearing what everybody has to say, and I totally agree that we need to focus on trying to um, encourage people to get the vaccine. That said, and it may not be the appropriate time today to have this conversation, but I've been uh, working in and around government for a long, long time. And I think we all know how the feelings have shifted about the way people feel about their governments. And when we first came on this commission, I was so proud of how much people had faith, trust, and confidence in their county commission. And it's very troubling to me, after all that we went through this last year, to see how those numbers have shifted. And so I just really feel compelled to remind everyone that we do require vaccines to enter our children in elementary school. If you send them to high school, uh, there's another requirement once they get into high school to show proof of certain vaccinations and booster shots and et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yes, and by the way, if your student wants to play sports, you have to have another list of vaccines that you show for your kids. We require citizens to wear seat belts, get a driver's license to drive a car, get a license to carry a gun. And let's remember that we eradicated polio, uh, measles, mumps, tuberculosis, whooping cough, and we eradicated smallpox because a federal mandate was issued to protect our citizens. Um, all because medical science and vaccines are evolving. And now we're in this crisis with the pandemic and the Delta variant 
which is changing and morphing as time goes by. So obviously we're learning more and more things from a scientific and a data-driven uh, base from which to make our decisions. So, you know, I guess I'd like to know at what point we're going to talk about what about our freedoms? What about our safety? Uh, don't we have some responsibility to, I don't know, it seems to me that we're spending an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to get the people who are making decisions not to get vaccinated. The burden has shifted to all of us who have decided to get vaccinated to keep the whole rest of the population safe. And that's a little bit of an issue for me. I know when I took my oath the very first time I was elected, I clearly understood what it meant to promise to do the best you could to protect the public health and safety of our citizens. I did not take an oath of fealty to the governor or to the state legislature. I'm concerned about protecting our citizens. You know, these preemption things that keep going on with the state, I mean, don't you ever wonder, like, what on earth do we still have government for, local government? It used to be that governments at all levels really cared about local government, and they would push the decisions down to local government that they didn't want to take by themselves. And for those of you that are former legislators, you know exactly what I mean. So um, I know, like Barry said, in my own family, I have family members who are hesitant to get the vaccine. It just drives me crazy. Uh, and my daughter is a nurse who is working in different facilities every day. And the facilities are under lockdown. The problem is the staff coming in who are infecting people in the hospitals and in the nursing homes. So um, I'm just a little over all of the crazy talk about not trusting government and all of that nonsense because we're not here just to have fun. I mean, we're all here because we're dedicated public servants. And so at the very least, uh, I think we ought to be able to do is to mask, manda mandate mask in the buildings that we own. I'm so proud of Publix and Walmart and Disney World. And my husband and I just came back from Alaska. It was very affirming to be able to get on a ship and before you could put one foot on board, you had to help show proof of vaccination. And they required mass in their elevators. And guess what? Everybody was compliant. So it was a wonderful feeling of safety. And on that, I'll just stop talking because I'm pretty sure I'm falling on deaf ears over here a little bit. You're falling on deaf ears, mm -hmm. what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, anybody else? Okay. Uh, Barry, any, uh, any, uh, any update from your perspective as far as um, our, our own facilities and what you're planning to do? Our own facilities, we have signs up that say um, to follow CDC guidelines, um, and that is a voluntary compliance. Obviously, the, um, we have uh, people need to come in and pay their taxes, get a permit, get other things. So. I don't have you know police at the door, um, right. but we certainly are encouraging that. We're in, we've sent out um, emails to employees encouraging both the vaccine and to stay safe. Um, but you know that's the way in which we're addressing it. Okay. We have seen other local governments take different approaches. Okay. All right. Um, anybody else on the on the matter right now? And again, I guess on Tuesday, next Tuesday, our commission meeting will have. Uh, uh, the doctors here to talk a little bit about some trends that they're seeing not only locally but issues uh, nationally that we're seeing on some of the yeah and the and and I, I want you to hear from them and I want you to hear these stories um, both you know for you and for the public because you know these are real life situations 
Um, you know, and when we talk about the issues in the hospitals, it's not just COVID. Um, it is staffing. Um, you know, they haven't, uh, we, I mean, we've seen the staffing issues in lots of different areas, but hospitals are not exempt from that. And so they're talking about how they get travel nurses and other things back to be able to staff up. And I'm sure part of it is, you know, their staff has COVID, and so they're out. Um, I'm sure people have given up the profession and went into other professions because it's been a long and very tough year. Yeah. Um, you know, for our, these are, these are, you know, our first line responders. Um, and so there's a lot of things that are playing into that. COVID is one piece. Yeah. And so they're having, they're having a lot of problems. But I'll let them, you know, give you those real life examples. And then we'll talk about some of the system status management that they're working on. Um, and, and Dr. Jamison can go over some, as, a, as our medical director, he's got to make some calls in terms of how to respond effectively. Those are tough calls. Yeah. And um, so he's he's developing some of those options. He's working with our hospitals um, on those, and I'll I'll let him explain some of those. Yeah, but uh, th it's real. Yeah, I mean I think we keep talking about finding folks that are out there that ha have a connection with with people to talk about the vaccine and and that. And I think one of the areas that has concerned me for some time is the folks that are actually out there in the in the hospitals that are taking care of us right. uh, a high percentage not getting vaccines themselves and i don't know if that i don't know what, what that's all about i don't understand i don't know if that's still the case barry and I, maybe they can come and they can talk to us about that but to me that's an important messaging that we um there's a, there's many that have gotten the vaccine so maybe we need some more messaging from that um, I, I, yeah. They could probably answer that better than I, but, yeah. um, you know, I'm sure. Um, and, and I hope that we're, you know, we are moving uh, that percentage upward. Yeah, I think that's when we found early on in the in some of the nursing homes, you know, some of the, that was an issue. It, so. was, it was absolutely staffing yeah. that was, you know, bringing it in. Yeah. And, so. um, you know. Yeah. So, so hopefully we can, I'm sure that's still the issue that with the one or two cases that we're seeing in but, that, in but that what arena. we're you know we've always said with the and i don't want to get into you know I, so much misinformation and 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 so much information that are is different and so people have to make their own judgment about yeah. what they believe but you know you, it's it's like a chain you don't have to have 100 percent to be able to break that chain but we need to be higher than where we're at yeah. and and i'd like dr cho and them you know speak to that but that's just the importance of, of a moving the needle a little bit. Probably a bad, you know, analogy, but mo moving that a little bit would make a big difference. Yeah. You know, another 10, 15 percent, 20 percent. We're seeing that in in the nursing homes. So you know, yeah. now that we've got our nursing homes up over 85 percent, we're not having that is that issue. Yeah. So I'm sure there's people that are in, um, you know, a, a nurse that comes in that didn't get, you know, vaccinated, and and they're in there. So, but but. That, that chain's broken because so many other people are. And so that's, um, that's where, where we need to get to. But it, it's absolutely impacting our healthcare system right now. Okay. All right. Um, I'm seeing no other comments right now. And then let's talk a little bit about the, um, we, a, a month ago, month and a half ago, um, <laughs> we said, uh, let's, let's decide, let's move back to the courthouse. And, Correct. You know, we in general said that. Obviously, a month later, we're seeing issues. Uh, to to move um, the August 10th meeting, we have issues. To move the August 24th meeting back here, we have other issues that we need to address today Correct. Um, to help us have that option open. So if you could address first, let's talk about the 24th so th and what so we need to do for that. So if you, um, so if you rec just to re refresh, we um, made a decision that our work sessions would continue to be out here through the end of the year but we would move our county commission meetings back to um, 315 Court Street uh, to our commission meeting room, um, effective the, um, the 10th. As you know, that's a very tight space. There's no, no other way around that. Um, you know, and so um, with the increase in the variant, the question is, is do you wanna move it back out here? The 10th, we have public meetings that are already advertised. We can't change that. The only thing we could do is if we hold the meeting there um, or if we cancel, if we move the meeting out here, we would have to cancel those public hearings. Um, and so that would impact, you know, whoever the public hearings are and I've got those here. If, we, if you choose to 
go from the 24th on, we could move those because we have time because we don't have any uh, quasi-judicial on the 24th, is that correct? And so we have time to change those advertisements. We, we, we do have some public hearings that are set um, for the 24th, but we have time if you all decide today that you wish to move the meeting on the 24th back here. We worked with Kat and her staff. There is time if you all decide today we can have those advertisements appropriately placed um, for this location. So that's that's the situation we're in. Now we have, Del, I think we said that, that would be good until October, um, and, and then we would have to make some decisions because we put some stuff out there re regarding October, so how long? Typically, the adver typically advertisements on or on all your ordinances. For instance, you all have the, the local option fuel tax that's scheduled for the 24th. We have to have 10 days advance notice on any ordinance that might come before you all. That's the legal requirement. We also need a few days on that for Kat and her staff to coordinate with the Times to have the ad, you know, prepared, proofed, and then you know placed in, in the newspaper. Um, you know, most other things, some of your land use cases and the like, those are things that we would still have time at this point if a decision is made to ch just basically change your meetings back to um, to this location, we could still alter um, those legal ads. Um, and, I, and I would want to say before I say absolutely without a doubt we can, we probably need to look at each specific case. Um, but from a practical perspective, I believe there's going to be ample time to do that. Um, the three cases that you have set for next week, they are all countywide planning authority issues. There are two cases from the city of Tarpon Springs and an ordinance, which is your second public hearing on amending the countywide rules. And Barry's absolutely correct. Uh, there's not enough time to re-advertise those public hearings uh, should you all decide you wish to move uh, the, your meeting for the 10th back here. They would have to be deferred to a subsequent date. Kat, did you have anything else uh, to add to that? Um, just one thing, the only um, advertisement that would fall outside of the normal realm of like the 10 to 14 days is we do have an upcoming uh, public hearing on October 12th, which is required to be advertised for four consecutive weeks. Um, so for that particular case, we would be advertising towards the end of August for the October 12th meeting, okay. just so you okay. know. And one other issue I do want to mention, um, please keep in mind you've got your budget hearings in September and we absolutely need to make sure that those are appropriately noticed. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. And so I just wanted to see what the, uh, right now we're going back to the courthouse right now. So do we want to change that direction and just stay where we are or, I mean, what's the will of the commission? I'm, I'm. I'm open. Yeah, Commissioner Seal. <clears throat> I think out of an abundance of caution that we should just move all meetings to here until the end of the year. <clears throat> this also, <clears throat> excuse me, makes it a little bit more consistent. You know, if we're doing work sessions here, then if we also have county commission meetings here, it makes sense. Now, as far as next week, <clears throat> I'm kind of up in the air on that. Uh -huh. I just don't know how critical the Tarpon Springs cases are. The county ride rules, I'm sure that could wait. Yeah, I think that we, we would need to get input from um, Forward Pinellas on how critical those are. I don't know whether any of you all that might be on the Forward Pinellas board recall those cases um, and the urgency of those, but we could certainly try to get an answer from staff, maybe even while we're here today. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. That would be great. Um, Commissioner Gerard. Okay, Commissioner I just Blower. wanted to say that we should check oh. and make sure that that wouldn't be a problem, but I agree that we need to go back or that we need to stay here. Commissioner Flowers. Uh, thank you. I, thank you, Commissioner Seal, for, for your comments on that. Um, I would feel better about being here because um, I've not yet had a meeting in the official boardroom, but if you look at the number of staff persons that we have here, plus anyone that comes from the public, you really, if you socially distance people, it will be all of our staff people. And then we probably have to have, I guess, a holding room or something for the community. And we've seen lately um, that, which is good, we have a lot of persons from the community 
that come in and share their feelings. And I just want us to feel like we're being safe and healthy, our staff as well as community residents. And we, and just as a reminder, we do ha still have the option for our residents to call in to our yes. commission meetings yes. virtually if they want to do that, as and long as they register the day before, mm -hmm. five o'clock the day before the meeting that we have in place. That, that's a wonderful yeah. piece. Commissioner Justice. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I basically was going to say exactly what Commissioner Flower said. Not only is it tight for the seven or nine of us at the dais, the room is much tighter for the public and staff. So um, probably staying here. And if if those aren't like emergency, then I would just cancel those public hearings and do the rest of the meeting here. So while we're doing the rest of the meeting, if you want, I'll um, we'll contact Board Pinellas and um, and then share their thoughts on that before um, you know before our meeting ends. Yeah, and I think there was one Tarpon Springs hearing. So you have you have two. Yeah, you have a um, Tarpon uh, Tarpon Springs. This is a map amendment from uh, residential medium to employment. Um, this. It was unanimously approved um, by Fort Pinellas Board, um, but it doesn't say whether there was any um, public opposition or anything to it. So I'd have to ask them to whether or not you expect public or not. Um, and then you have a another one that is employment uh, to retail on 0.61 acres. Again, um, the Planners Advisory Committee meeting, um, need, they weren't able to meet on either one of these cases um, because of Tropical Storm Elsa. And so I, I don't have a good feel on whether or not uh, there's public opposition to either one of those. So I'd have to check with them on that. Okay, if we could do that before. Try yeah, to I'll ask some, staff to go ahead and do that. See if we can get some update before the end of the meeting. We uh, can do that, yes. Commissioner Gerard. Yeah, as I recall, there was no opposition at Forward Pinellas. Can we call the city and ask them how they feel? I sure. Mean, yeah. more, so, more than Forward Pinellas, I think we should call the city. Yeah, yep. exactly. <laughs> we'll, we'll contact both. So before we get to the agenda, um, we'll have an answer for you on that, and then you can make a decision about next week. How about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I think messaging is really important as we go forward, as specifically as possible, where we can help our residents and uh, navigate uh, the next few weeks and months uh, as far as it, as it relates to um, COVID um, and, and, and then continue to encourage in a, from a positive perspective uh, the, the vaccination process, um, and if not, at least uh, encourage people to, to continue to do their research on it, to understand exactly what their choices are all about so that they can at least, like we all do, we try to question our own, we try to question ourselves from time to time. Everybody continue to do that, and as they continue to soul search on their decision so far not to get vaccines, right. please, please reconsider that. Uh, and I think that messaging is important. I think carrots a lot more important than sticks at this point. We've been through a lot in this last year, year and a half, and it's really important that we galvanize together as a community instead of doing things that separate us and divide us anymore. We've done enough of that, in my opinion. And so to the extent that we can work together and listen to each other and, and encourage each other and be there for each other, I think it's really important. So, I mean, I think the signal to move to stay here, I'll say, I think is important. Let's be careful, be smart about things, and uh, move forward uh, uh, in a positive way. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to agree to move. I, I really hate not to move back. I mean, it just it just makes me uh, upset that we can't do that. But I do think to be cautious, to be careful uh, at this point, it's probably a good thing. Um, and and Lin Linda Fisher is watching and. <laughs> <laughs> said it's fine with them. So we'll contact the city out of abundance of caution. Okay. And uh, once we have an answer back from the city, if that's okay. okay so then. MPO, we're okay with the forward Pinellas. The MPO okay. is okay with so us see, postponing but those. Um, but again, we'll check with the city um, also if, if and uh, and confirm before, before we get to the agenda portion. And would those uh, then also move to the 24th? Is that, uh, or do you have to? Well, we'd have to re-advertise them. So I'm not sure if we can make it on the 24th or not. We can. Cat, do you know? We we could submit the advertisements tomorrow and still have time. Okay, so okay. we're 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 on that date. If they hit it by tomorrow, we can make it. Okay. So, all right. Um, yes. So we'll wait to hear from the city of Tarpon Springs. And okay, then. and I I'll, I'll ask Della to reach out. Okay. While we're waiting. Any other any other thoughts um, before we wrap it up? So we are going to move. Um, the tenth, as long as the city of Tarpon Springs is okay for it, we'll move the tenth. We'll keep it here, starting on the tenth instead of starting on the 24th, mm -hmm. so.
So um, by the end of the meeting, we'll be able to positively tell people that the meeting on the 10th will occur right here. Here. Yes. So, um, all right. Anything else, Barry, before we uh, jump into the agenda? I think um, that's it. Anybody else on the commission? Okay. Go ahead, Barry. Okay, commissioners. Um, we have two items uh, to discuss this morning, both the transportation trust fund, which you know we gave a presentation for as part of the budget um, recommendation, um, and uh, as part of that, establishing the maximum millage rates that we have to certify for the property appraiser. I'd ask for Abigail um, and to and Bill to come up and um, talk through. You know, Bill says uh, Abigail's on her own. Um, you know, he's he's already Thanks, checking. Bill. He's already checking out. I'm glad he has your back there. Um, but uh, um, but she's going to give you a little presentation where we're at on the transportation trust fund. You had asked some questions regarding. I mean, let's you know what what we've said before, and I, I just want to premise this. You know, the recommendation uh, we all agree on one thing is that we need to put more money into our infrastructure, and that's to our roads and our sidewalks. Um, the, the, the importance of this piece of the budget recommendation is 100% of this money goes towards exactly that. It doesn't go to general government. It doesn't go to support anything else. Um, and so how we accomplish that, there's a couple of different ways. And so some of you had asked about whether um, a, as part of us doing a rollback on our rate, as you see, most local governments are keeping the rate the same. We are actually reducing our rate to net that out. Um, to zero um, and increased dollars. Um, because we saved last year and we cut our budget last year and we cut our expenses. Um, if you choose to put that on the rate right side, we can do that. Um, but I'll let her go over that. I also wanna, I want them to prep in the back because I wanna show you something about impacts of, of, um, of the market. Um, and there's, there's a little app, I did a, I did a little drive. And I, I really wanted to see what happens on Pasco County side of the border, and what happens when you come one mile south on the on Pinellas side of the border? Because they already have the nickel on their gas tax, and I found and my own unscientific who was about two cents difference, um, you know, even though they have the nickel. So there's a lot of market forces that go into play. I actually found a gas station it, that was out of three. There was actually um, one that was actually the same as ours, and then two that were like two cents difference. But and then I come south and I saw more than a nickel difference just on my drive home, you know, between, between corners of gas stations. So I'm not sure exactly how you factor into that. But, um, but, but, I, but she's got a whole presentation. I'll let her stop there. But there's a nap that you can do to kind of look at these gas prices. And, um, you know, and so I wanted to put that out for your consideration. Um, yeah, uh, Barry, um, and, and so on the gas tax that we currently have in place, the six cents. My understanding, at least we've been told all along, now I don't know how we split that, but that, that gas tax is for not only capital, but also for operating. There's different pieces to that. That's part of Abigail's presentation. Yeah. She had about, um, she studied this thing. She had about 80 slides, but uh, we, got, we, got her, we got her down to a reasonable amount. And so I, I, I'd really like to let her go through her little presentation. I think that'll answer some of the question about where do the dollars go? And then how we can, and then some of the options that we have here. So I, I kind of got a little ahead of her, but I wanted to just kind of put that out before she starts her presentation, but go ahead. All right, Abigail, go ahead. Thank Thanks. you, Barry. All right, so why are we here? The Transportation Trust Fund, um, you've been hearing about this since the original budget information sessions and probably several years in advance of this, but it's facing uh, what we think is gonna be the first year of deficit in fiscal year 22. Um, and that's primarily because it's a stagnant revenue source and it has, the revenue has not been increasing over time and it hasn't been keeping up with the inflationary costs of uh, taking care of our current transportation infrastructure. Um, and if we don't do something about this deficit, we're gonna be unable to maintain our current level of service. And then also through this process, we've identified key program areas that we actually think the levels of service are unacceptable, like Barry mentioned in our sidewalks and our resurfacing programs. So we're coming today with a staff recommendation. Um, this includes the loft expansion, the local option fuel tax for the one through five cents, expanding that. 
Um, if we expand the local option fuel tax, we'll be able to delay that transportation trust fund deficit. And then also in the staff recommendation, we're recommending increasing our level of ser service for sidewalks and resurfacing. We're also gonna discuss what the other alternatives are, um, this dedicated property tax, what that would look like, and how that would impact trim. And then just as a reminder, you're gonna be voting on the ordinance to levy the additional loft on August 24th. So what do we use our transportation trust fund for? Um, everything supporting our transportation infrastructure, our maintenance and operations, and this is everything from our roads and curbs and bridges to our street sweeping, our storm water, our tree trimming, arterial lighting, pavement marking. There's a portion of it that goes to the ATMS ITS system, transportation engineering and design, and then also some of our right-of-way permitting. So this right here is our forecast for the Transportation Trust Fund if no action is taken. No service levels are increased and no subsidies are provided to this fund. You can see that in FY22, we're projecting that first year of deficit of $3.3 million. Um, I also wanna call attention to the difference between the blue line and the gray line. The blue line is our current expenditures for the Transportation Trust Fund. In FY22, we're expecting a $38.1 million expenditure, and then also $28.3 million in revenue. So there's about a $10 million difference uh, that fluctuates over time between FY22 and FY27, where we're just not bringing in as much revenue as we're spending, and that's what's contributing to the fund balance going down into a deficit. Commissioner Eggers, you asked about our revenue sources. So the Transportation Trust Fund is not just one revenue source. It's made up of several pieces. Um, this chart shows those revenue sources versus our total expenditure. So that blue, um, that blue column at the very bottom, that is our ninth cent fuel tax. That's the fund source that's specifically restricted to ATMS and ITS expenditures. That part of the revenue cannot be used for our maintenance and operating budgets. Um, the orange section is our state shared fuel tax, and the gray section is our current local option fuel tax, the six cents that we collect. Those two revenue sources, the state shared and the local option fuel tax, those revenues are flexible. They can be used for all of the maintenance and operating expenses for the infrastructure. And then that yellow bar right across the top, that's our interest earnings on the funds and then also our grant revenues. And those are typically restricted to the grant operations that we receive those revenues for. And if you notice, all of the revenue between FY21 and FY27 is very stagnant. It does not increase. And you can compare that to our expenditures, which you see are consistently going up at about a 2 to 3% inflationary rate each year. So this slide is really important. This is using the Ford Pinellas estimates for the annual cost to a single driver of what it would be to expand the local option fuel tax. This used Federal Highway Administration data. We took the average miles driven by a single driver in a year of 13,500. We divided, by that, divided that by our average fuel mileage of a car of 24.9 miles per gallon. And we multiplied that by our five cents per gallon. And the additional cost that we arrive at annually for a driver is 27 dollars and 11 cents. If you have a two driver household, that would be $54 and 22 cents annually for your household. So this brings us to our staff recommendation. So our FY22 loft expansion of five cents is included in the staff recommendation. We would split this 60% and 40% between the county and the municipalities, and this is the distribution that was agreed upon in the interlocal agreement. The interlocal agreement was approved at an 88% approval rating for our incorporated um, areas. Um, this will result in an additional projected revenue of $9.3 million annually for Pinellas County. And those funds have to be used to support related transportation, capital related transportation, sidewalk initiatives, and additional resurfacing projects. So included in our staff recommendation is some adjustments to other funding. That includes a $4 million one-time general fund subsidy to the fund that will specifically address our current sidewalk backlog, which is about two years at this time. Also, in our other funding adjustments, this isn't included in our forecasts, but we're potentially going to be incorporating American Rescue Plan Act funds. We don't know necessarily 
how much money we will be able to incorporate from the ARPA funds, but that is kind of on the docket in the future. And then we're also projecting to do a repayment from our capital projects fund from an FY19 transfer that occurred of six point two five million dollars. We're going to repay that back to the Transportation Trust Fund over two years in FY23 and FY24. And then also included on this slide, it's not really part of the staff recommendation, but it is something that's coming up in the future. We will need to renew the ninth cent in FY27, and then the current local option fuel tax, the six cents, that will have to be renewed in FY28. Um, Abigail, on, on slide four, where we were $10 million short and also $3.3 million short in the fund, I'm assuming that is all related to Pinellas County, us only, right? That's correct. So, so that this, this money that you're talking about, this additional $9.3 million, uh, essentially comes close to offsetting what we're short. Is that, I just wanna make sure I'm comparing dollars to the right account. That's correct. So actually, a good comparison for that $9.3 million that we're discussing in new revenue that would come from the loft, that would cover the gap between that $28.3 million in revenues you see on this slide and the $38.1 million in expenditures you see on this slide. So it, it just about covers that $10 million gap. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure I was clear on that. Go ahead. All right, to give you a quick picture of within the staff recommendation, what we're talking about of increasing level service in sidewalks and resurfacing programs. The $4 million subsidy from the general fund would address our sidewalk program and would eliminate that two-year backlog. And then also, um, we would be able to take the additional revenue from the local option fuel tax and put some of that towards our resurfacing projects. And we would have about a 20 million or 20 mile increase each year of resurfacing uh, lanes on average between FY22 and FY26. Uh, could you could you s say that again? I want to understand that resurfacing comment. Sure. So um, there's going to be additional revenue from the local option fuel tax if we expand it, and a portion of the, those funds can be used for resurfacing projects because they're spe it's specifically a restricted funding source for capital projects. And our chart right here on the bottom of this slide is our estimated additional lane miles resurfaced annually um, with that additional revenue. And not, not, not to put you on the spot, but what is the total lane miles that our penny is, is, is doing? Uh, in the same 20, in fiscal year 22, I'm just trying to get perspective. We're adding 1.3 lane miles. What are we doing in, out, out of our penny in lane miles in 22? Um, I'm not familiar with that number. I can get you that number. Okay, thank you. Sure. Kelly's here. Oh. She, she'll come up and okay, give you that. Okay, let her get okay. that information. Thank you. Go ahead. We'll get that to you. All right, so there's some additional factors. I know we've talked about this before for the loft expansion, but just to point out and remind you that instead of a property tax, it's more of a user fee. And so the revenue from a loft expansion, it's restricted to be only used for transportation expenses. Um, also, because it's a user fee, it's going to be collected from not only our residents, but our non-residents, our tourists, and they can contribute a significant portion to that additional revenue. Um, if we were to do a designated property tax, that would only be a tax imposed on our property owners and that uh, general funding source is more flexible and could be used for any governmental purpose. Um, similarly, our pure gas taxes, we've looked at those too. Uh, there's 36 counties, including Pasco, Manatee, and Sarasota that currently have expanded their loft to the full 12 cents. Uh, Hillsborough County uh, is only at 7 cents and that's where we are currently. So if we move forward with uh, the items that are in our staff recommendation, this is what our new forecast would look like. Obviously, this would not totally alleviate um, the issues with the Transportation Trust Fund, but it would extend the life of the fund all the way until the end of fiscal year 24. Um, after that time, we would be hitting a deficit again. Well, what this does do is there's so many things that are occurring at, at the state and federal level regarding how we pay for infrastructure. It allows some of those questions to be answered. It also allows to see whether we can use our dollars as match dollars and things like that. It just gives us some time for some of those other questions to, to work themselves out. So uh, it, although it is kicking the can down the road a little bit, um, there's, there's a lot of other things in play. 
So some of our next steps, as I mentioned on August 24th, that's when you'll be considering the ordinance to levy the additional loft. And if that is approved on the 24th, uh, the levy would con commence collections on January 1st. Um, and then also the September 9th, and the September 21st public hearings, that's when um, you'll determine your decision on, oh, based on your decision on August 24th, if you vote uh, to levy the additional loft, then the general fund countywide millage will be at the full rollback rate. And if you do not vote to expand the loft, then the rate will be um, at 5.1768, which would ensure that there would be sufficient funds to keep the transportation fu trust fund solvent. I think, I th and I think that was the, the question. I think we cut that out of one of the slides, the, the, that rate. So, the, uh, so for the, the $9 million that this generates for our transportation trust fund, um, the rate, cover, cover the rate now, what the rollback rate would be, and what it would be if we wanted to increase the millage rate to equal to capture that $9 million. Uh, so um, if we do not expand the local option fuel tax, then the millage would not be rolled back to the full amount that it's It would be considered. to. I don't know, I might need Bill's help here. Good morning, commissioners. Um, so the point that uh, we're all making is that the full rollback rate is what we would hope to do. That's what the staff recommendation is. That is enabled by imposing the additional five cents. If we don't enable that and we don't impose the five cents and instead choose to resolve on a temporary basis the transportation trust funding issue starting in 22, our alternative option is to impose millage in order to be able to achieve that. The millage that would be necessary to generate the same amount as the five cents would equate to 1.1598 mills, which means that it would be a partial rollback rate instead of a full rollback rate for the general fund millage. That amount also ensures that the 40% that we intend to distribute to the cities with transportation trust would also still be given to the cities yeah. with those funds. So we would be generating $15 million additional, just like we would have but five Bill, cents You can do it either way, okay? Um, you, you, you can generate the $9 million. So we, we eliminate, we were trying to skinny down the, the presentation, but we had a slide that talked about your rate now is 5.2, what's 5. the millage? 5.2755 is your current millage okay, rate. Okay, your current millage rate. If you would put that on the get the millage side, you still can roll back your rate and generate the nine million or the fifteen million. The fifteen million is what would, if you wanted to, distribute that to the cities. I really that would be a dangerous precedent to set, in my opinion. But um, so the nine million would even be a lower rate. So that would be a rate of five point, what? I don't have that figure in my head, but I can get by the yeah, time so, I come back. Uh, so I want to I give you those. So those are those are your options. But the, either way, the, if you wanted to put that on the millage side versus the loft side, we could still do that. It would still be a rollback rate. Okay, but there are other alternatives. There we, are. We, we, we've talked about them. You've already brought them up this morning for next year. I'm saying there are other alternatives to make sure that we cover that $3.3 .3 million shortfall. You brought them up this morning. You talked about repayment from a capital fund um, that could pay that could cover that three point three million dollars shortfall this year. Well, actually, that 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 is that's a payment back out of uh, what we what we covered from the penny from before. That is not feasible for FY twenty two. And so, and when that, does that money get paid back? That would be in twenty three and twenty four. It's spread between the two years, and that's based on the cash flow for our penny projects. Okay. Um, Commissioner Flowers. Oh, Commissioner Peters, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I need these rates. I, I just want to be clear on the cities. Um, and if the cities aren't doing rollbacks, then the cities are. are I'm, I'm not proposing that. Absolutely, you're I, not, not looking to think. Thank you. I, I'm not, I, I I'm just not need proposing that. that. We, we've got we've, our staff um, recommendations. We have we've have a couple of options. You can generate the $15 million that the full loft would and we share that with the cities, or we generate the $9 million. I, if, if you're going to go to the property tax side of generating the money that the law would, I would recommend you go to the nine, the $9 million side. And so that would create a rate of, and Bill's going to get that. So either way, your rate, your rate, property tax rate, would go down 
uh, either way. It just wouldn't go down as much as a full rollback rate if, um, you know, if we did the, the loft side also. Uh, Commissioner Flowers. With no benefit to the cities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I think what Bill is doing is probably going back there working out the calculations <laughs> because yes. I, I want to be able to make sure I'm clear on what the millage would be in each instance. So I know he's back there probably working on he's, that. He, he's got that. We, okay. we, it, it just it dropped off on our um, that. So, so. so the millage rate currently is? Currently is 5.2755. Right. The full rollback rate which is what you see in your proposed budget right now, is 5.0170. To generate an additional $9 million, we would need the equivalent of 0 0.0959 mills. What that means is if we generate the additional 9 million, your partial rollback rate will be 5.1129. There you go. So 5.2755, versus 5.1129 if you're using millage as the way to resolve this problem on a temporary basis. So I have a couple more questions. So the presenter stated that should we go with the proposal from staff increasing the gas tax, that that would only get us out through 2024. Doing a partial rollback would also only get us out through 2024. Correct. It's, sure. it, it doesn't change it, it's the, the same way the amount funds of are being money. used. It's just how are you generating the dollars? Yeah. Okay. And so at that point, or a little bit prior to that point, we're going to be back at this conversation talking about how we will generate revenue for this source because the graph clearly demonstrates we'll be in a decline again, correct? We will, but it gives us a few years to work on those. And so, but yes, that, that is correct. It, it only generates nine million. If we're going to fund the level of infrastructure investment that we've recommended, then, uh, then this, this gives us a, several years, but it does not solve it permanently. Typically for federal matching grants, if you're, if you have some historical perspective on that. When they are asking for matching grant dollars, do they determine or state that it has to be from this source or that source? In other words, if we were to approve a partial increase of millage, that would still be able to be utilized for a match on a federal level or not? Typically, we, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how we match those dollars. I, but I, but I, I think there's, I, I don't want to oversell what would be in the infrastructure package at a federal level because a lot of that's new infrastructure, right. um, not necessarily maintenance, which is a lot of what ours is, um, but it could have an impact. That's something that we're going to have to analyze and see. Okay. And but but I, I, if you don't mind, uh, on that point, I do want to also point out that our lobbyists have consistently told us in the past, and we haven't had the conversation in a number of years. But in the past, we had been criticized for not imposing the full amount that we can at a local level and then asking for funds from the federal government. That's, and that that's, has that's made us question. less competitive. That's the question in that the I past. was trying to get at. Which, yeah, okay, so thank you. And um, I think this will be my last question. Um, for catching up with the backlog of two years on sidewalk repairs and some other things generating the nine million will just get us caught up to our backlog or will that allow us to handle our backlog plus any current things that are coming in because it makes no sense in my opinion to only request a portion that will handle your backlog but it's not going to take care of your current work orders. Bill, go, go back a couple of slides. Um, it, it actually allows us to get caught up and maintain it. Okay. Um, so keep on going back. So here, here you can you can see the um, it would our replacement rate would be 6.3 miles a year versus 3.5 because our backlog grows at about 10 percent a year and so and remember you know we saved money last year and so we're using one-time money to uh, to apply to try to get us caught up and then this additional amount of money on this side allows us to maintain that going out okay thank you appreciate it mr. chair yeah commissioner long 
Chair. Um, so my question, I have a couple of them, Bill, is in our current millage rate, what does that translate to for the ordinary citizen when you talk about full rollback versus partial rollback? Do you know? So the average residential home taxable value is $175,000. And it's important to know that's taxable value. So that includes the impact of saver homes and exemptions. Because all of you know that if you look out at the property or the uh, residential market, you're not gonna find a whole lot of homes that you would consider average that you can purchase for $175,000. Correct. Um, so I wanna make sure it's clear that I'm talking about taxable value because that is what is relevant to how much you pay in property taxes. So if you look at a millage rate of 5.2755 for that, then you're gonna be looking at an average of, I believe it's around 800 plus dollars for that general fund millage. The savings that would be generated at the full rollback rate is $45.25. Versus the partial would be half of that? The partial millage rollback, if you're talking about that, that's going to be, bear with me for a second while I calculate this. That's going to reduce that 45.25 by $16.79. And Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> Overarching all of this discussion, correct me if I'm wrong, Barry, we haven't even begun to talk about a dedicated uh, one cent tax for transportation trust fund, right? You In this conversation, a, none of that. A sales, a, you mean a sales tax referendum? Yeah, yeah. Yes, we have not. Yeah. So to your concerns, Commissioner Flowers, um, it, you know, I am certainly aware that, and I don't know how many, but since I've been on the county commission, there have been an awful lot of our municipalities that have consistently found themselves in a place where they had to raise the millage rate uh, as they were working on their budgets. We on the county commission, since I have been on the county commission, which now I am in my ninth year, have never raised the millage rate. It hasn't even been a discussion in our budget meetings, as I recall. So I, um, after listening to this, seems to me that as it relates to our citizens' perspective, we have the best of both worlds in terms of how we put our budget together because regardless of what we do, we are able to increase the millage and at the same time give our citizens a bit of relief but not increase the gas tax. Decrease our millage. De huh? You'd said increase our millage, decrease yeah. our millage. Yeah, yeah, with the partial rollback, right? Yeah, yeah, that's I got yeah. that right. Yeah. yeah, is that right? That is an option. Okay, and because my concern, if we say today we're going to do a full rollback rate as has been recommended, and then we come right back after the first of the year and start talking about imposing a one cent sales tax specific to um, the transportation trust fund, that is really going to be a mouthful of explanation to communicate with our citizens, given we also have the penny for Pinellas tax. Do you know what I mean? I mean, these are complicated issues. And look at the problem we're having just trying to get people to take care of themselves by getting a vaccine, which does not involve their finances because they're not having to pay for it. So if I, I, I think that's a slippery slope. I'm just me personally. 
Um, excuse Thank me. You. Excuse me, Commissioner Seal. Um, <clears throat> could you tell me between um, the the current millage of 5.2755 and the proposed rollback, what that translates into actual dollars in our budget in total? Are you talking about the full rollback rate or the partial rollback rate? The full rollback rate, what does between 5.0170 and 5.2755, what's that dollar amount that we are foregoing? I'll need to run that calculation because I don't remember that off the top of my head. Okay, I'd like 24. to. I thought it was 24. It's about $24 million. About $24 million, okay. Bam. <laughs> okay. Um, I tend to concur with Commissioner Long, and I have mentioned this before, but other municipalities have, by ordinance, put into their general fund budget an ordinance that is you know, dedicated towards, say, repaving roads or for maintenance of roads, and we could do the same thing, and then that would become a dedicated source of money. Granted, a future county commissioner could take that away because it's by ordinance, but it would, so we could actually solve our problem past 2024 if we looked at this properly. And I just hate kicking the can down the road. Um, that's what we're doing. We are just saying we're plugging this in for temporary time being. And let's say we do do a one cent sales tax. Well, then we might be able to roll back the millage rate at that point if we know that we have dedicated money coming in. But for me, I think we're just being short-sighted. Um, another point that I'd like to make is that $9 million, if property values continue to go up, you would see more than $9 million a year um, in versus the gas tax. People are buying more electric vehicles. That gas tax is not going to increase. We're we're counting on the fact that we're going to continue to get $9 million, $9.3 million a year. We have no guarantees that that will happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, until we can get to some better user fee, such as vehicle ma miles traveled or something else that actually is calculated by people using our roads, we are, you know, really looking at a regressive tax through the gas tax. and. Um, you know, I, another argument I would make is that with, <clears throat> granted, tourists do pay for gas tax, that's correct, but they also indirectly pay for um, millage <clears throat> in general fund when they visit a hotel, the hotel is paying property taxes. So that's going to be calculated into the rate that they pay at the hotel. So indirectly, if you look at that, you would be you know, obtaining tourist support through property taxes. I know that's a bit of a stretch, but it. But think about <laughs> it. I mean, I, it'd be interesting to see what a couple of our major hotels pay in property taxes and what they have been over the last, say, several years. So I could go on and on, but I just think we're being short-sighted by rolling this back and um, the final point that I'll make is <clears throat> don't forget in the slides in the next um, presentation which goes over what um, I think it's the very last one, one of the slides where by law you have to have levels of votes for increasing the millage. So if we roll back this year and next year we needed um, for something happens that is horrific um, and we needed the money, then you might have to get a supermajority vote by the county commission to increase the millage. So, and I don't even know what those rates would be at this point. So if we roll back to 5.0170, I don't know what levels would be needed by, you know, majority versus supermajority versus unanimous, remember? If you increase the taxes, then you have um, votes that are needed to support that. So thank you.
Uh, C Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've lost track of where I was at the very beginning of this. I, I do think that you know that the gas tax is not going to be around forever in the way that we see it today. There was a great article in the Times a few weeks back about uh, how roads are paid for locally, state, nationally, and it was fascinating. The Ford F-150, the the current gas model weighs 4,700 pounds, whereas the Ford F-150 electric model weighs 6,500 pounds, putting much more wear and tear on our roads and paying no gas tax. So it's that is going to be you know it's fascinating. The state gas tax is tied uh, to an index, so it raises every year or not without a vote by the state legislature. Uh, and it's continually gone up over the last 20 years. Um, if you look at a state map of Florida, it's really kind of interesting to see which counties levy which rate. Um, we're, you know, Pinellas and Hillsborough are the only two in central Florida, west central Florida, that don't charge that. And that's what we always heard from our state legislative delegation was, don't come asking us for money when you haven't even levied your full gas tax. So, and those all go into the mix. Um, I, I do want to get a little bit more information about that that loan, that inner departmental loan we did from, I guess, from Penny to transportation. Is that what it was? No, we actually uh, moved money from transportation to Penny to accomplish some priority projects uh, that were important back a couple of years ago. Okay. And that was because we had a very large fund balance at the time in the transportation trust fund. We knew it was going to be declining, but we felt that the priorities were such that those projects need to be done now instead of having the money sit in the bank. Okay. And then, and I, I, I would hesitate for us to even talk about ARPA as a, as a fund source for anything uh, until we have that real conversation about ARPA. And, and so and that's, that kind of raised my yeah. eyebrow a little bit when I saw that on the slide. I saw, I saw that, and ARPA, you, you can use, that is not a funding source for sidewalks. You can use it for a limited basis. So for instance, in um, certain um, demographic areas, you can, you can use it. So we're looking at it like for our safe routes to schools, for instance. And so there's some limited uses that we can, we can do with that. We put it in there as this is, these are other things that we're trying to stretch our dollars with and we can you know, use that, but it's not a solution to our infrastructure um, funding issue. And that's not built into any of the figures that you see. Sure, no, I, I know it's not in the dollar. Just it, it, when I saw it listed, I, yeah. I once something is said once, and then it's said a third time and a fourth time, it becomes like, well, we're doing that, and we've never actually had a discussion about it. So no. that's, that's the ways where I, uh, I wanted to make sure. And then I certainly wouldn't want to have our millage pay for a city portion of that normal formula. How is that formula, that 60 40, that 40 percent, how is that divvied up among our 24 municipalities? Is it revenue or population or? Population based. Population based, okay. Um, I'm trying to think what else. No, but thank you, Ms. Lloyd and Mr. Berger. Good presentation. Uh, Commissioner G Gerard. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought I knew what I wanted when I walked in here. But <laughs> Um, and I thought that was the gas tax, but uh, Commissioner Seal makes some excellent points about rolling back and then having to roll forward again. I, it's a scary proposition. Um, I mean, I thought that the gas tax might be fairer across the board because it is shared with the cities, but that's basically their problem. <laughs> I know that's a terrible thing to say, but... Um, if they already are taking money out of their general fund to do transportation projects, then they can raise their military just the same as we we can. Um, and yeah, this is a disappearing source of funds. Probably sooner rather than later. I mean, some of the car manufacturers are not even going to not even going to produce gas-powered vehicles anymore within the next 10 years or so. So, uh, yeah, I like the idea of rolling halfway back and um, using that money. I don't know if we need to make it a dedicated source or just a dedicated source in our own policy. Um, 
I mean, what's the difference with that? The only, I mean, a policy, I mean, you can do a policy or you can do an ordinance. Either way, it would probably take a vote by the county commission to repeal it. To me, an ordinance just is a little more, you know, sends a more important message that that's what we want to dedicate the money towards. But it wouldn't matter either way. <clears throat> Anything else, Commissioner Jura? Anything else? Uh, Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure if I understood what Commissioner Seal said, that she wouldn't uh, support a rollback at all. I just want to make sure I understood what you said. I don't think I made a final position about that, okay. Um, okay. whether a partial rollback would make me happy or not. I haven't made it. Okay. That's why I asked what the okay. bottom line was. It's $24 million that we're talking about. Um, if we did a partial rollback rate, then I guess that would be around 15 14, million. 14, That'd be 15 about 15 million. million. That'd be about 15 million. Okay. You're back Roll the $9 back. Million out of the 24. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I was very strongly advocating for the rollback rate because, and I'm looking at last year. Um, last year, we had a tax increase by leaving it where it was, of $31 million. That didn't pay for a bill. It went into our reserves. We collected more than that. I believe Mike Twitty said it was about 8 or 9% bill. I don't know what that translates to. Um, so we collected significant revenue last year that didn't pay a bill. It strictly went into reserves. So, um, so I'm not fearful. You know, um, I, I don't see Florida's uh, property values plummeting that would ever put us in a position that we would have to raise our millage so much so that we would have to get a two-thirds majority. And if we were in such a crisis, then I don't think that uh, any commission, whatever that board would be, if it's that kind of a crisis, would have a problem get that two-thirds uh, majority vote. Um, what I'm concerned about right now is what our citizens have gone through in the last year and a half. They've gone through enormous amounts of stress, great deal of unemployment. For so many months, they couldn't get unemployment because the state system failed. Uh, many businesses struggled significantly. Uh, many of our beach communities started to pick up and then red tide has come in and now they're seeing another um, cutback and it's like they've been hit and hit and hit and hit. Um, and so I just think it's really important that we give them something back after last year taking when they were going through such a horrific time, the worst probably ever in the history of the state. And, and, I, and I, I believe that, they, they, that we should do this, especially since our reserves are as healthy as they are. Um, you know, I, I, I was looking for a full rollback rate. I understand the issue with the transportation. I would be happy with half of that um, and getting that $9 million and taking care of that. Um, but I, I'm not looking to impose any kind of tax increase on any level to our citizens until they get back on their feet um, emotionally, fiscally, and, and um, you know, they've just been through a whole lot. We've got a lot of people now that, you know, have to pay rent. I know there's been a lot of talk about that because that has been gone. Um, there certainly have been a lot of job opportunities out there. Um, never seen so many for sales, for hire signs in my life. But, um, but I think that uh, it's good stewardship for us to roll back this, whether it's halfway or all the way. And, and that's just the position I'm at. Um, the gas tax, you know, we can talk about that I, maybe at another time. I would much rather see us take this out of property tax than add another um, tax at the pump. We always can at some point talk about a, a user fee for electric cars um, because they are there is a wear and tear for electric cars on our vehicles or, or on our roads. And if we want to start exploring that option, that's an option. Um, but I fully support some rollback rate, whether it be the halfway or the full rollback rate. Um, I think our citizens deserve it, and, and we should give it to them. Uh, thank you. Um, I, okay, uh, Commissioner Gerard. I just had a question about, about a user fee on electric vehicles. Is that something that local government can even do? No. We, we, that would require a legislative change, and that would probably be enacted at a state level. Um, hopefully they'll talk about it, but I, yeah, Correct. I didn't think it was something we could do. Um, yeah, okay, so I got a, a couple of comments as well. Um, 
I think last year, uh, for the first time that I can remember, uh, we did a two-year budget plan, uh, with the idea being that we would uh, keep residents' money last year, cut our expenses, raise our reserves uh, in anticipation of the unknown, <laughs> which we weren't sure what the economy was going to do. And, um, and as difficult as it was to watch those reserves going up, it, it made sense to me. But at the, at the same time, this year, it's about giving money back mm -hmm. by, by, that, that, by that method. And when you look at the numbers that we went through today, we are taking, we're giving money back and we're taking just as much back again in the, in the form of additional gas tax. Um, so the proposal on the table, I, I just have no interest in that. Um, I, I think we need to figure out something a little more creative, and I know staff can do it. So I have a, um, so anyway, let me just finish. The, we've talked about it among many of us here, that the gas tax itself, the fund, the, the app is broken. So we're going to do something this year that patches it, the proposal, that next year or the year after we're going to have a similar problem all over again. So for, from my perspective, that's a separate issue that we need to t talk about for another day. Um, kicking the can down the road is no interest to some of you. Um, and I think we're being short-sighted to look at just this year or next year. And frankly, I am all about um, looking at our residents' uh, situations. And we have had a lot of lost jobs. There are job opportunities. Do they match? A lot of people still not being able to pay their mortgage. We've heard uh, record numbers of people not being able to pay their rent. Um, that was another question that I wanted to talk about at another time. Are we not getting the money to the folks that we need to be getting money to? Um, but again, that's another issue. So we have people that have lost their jobs, people that can't pay their mortgage, can't pay their rent. Um, and so the message cannot be to raise taxes this year. I mean, it just can't be. So we're talking about rolling back the millage. We're talking about figuring out another way. And I guess my question is, instead of rolling the millage rate back, how many dollars do we have sitting in reserves that could be used to offset the $3.3 million shortfall this year in our trust fund? We have a $3.3 million shortfall in our trust fund. At least that's what I, the way I read it. Um, and so we could take that out of our reserves and not affect our millage rate. You, you could, but that would be spending one-time dollars for ongoing costs. Because that understand, is I understand. too maintain. I'm looking for creative solutions without raising taxes and getting a, a, taking full advantage of a rollback, a full rollback that we talked about a month ago. And I think that's where we need to be in my in so, my in my thinking. So so uh, so let me let me just kind of clarify. What we're facing next year is a $3.3 million deficit right. with, um, with, without that increase. That grows to, to $9 million or $11 million the following year. Right. So, so it, we could use one-time money that would solve a gap, but that gap continues to grow. So that would be then two years' worth of not increasing revenue. The, the, the difference here is what we're talking about is spending more on roads and sidewalks. So, so in the past, what we were doing is we're, we were cutting our expenses. Last year, we reduced our operating expenses for the departments that report to the Board of Commissioners uh, by 4%. Um, we reduced our, our actual expenses. At the same time, we're spending more for the sheriff, for body cameras for things like that that we all agree needed to occur. So, you know, we're, this is, in, we're talking about spending more on our roads and infrastructure. If, we, if we're gonna spend more on roads and sidewalks, well then we need a revenue source to do it. If we do it out of reserves, I would recommend we not increase the expenses then because I don't have a funding source permanently to offset that uh, increase. Again, on the gas cost. tax, I was, I've been told, now I'm, I'm starting to hear differently this morning, so I wanna make sure I'm clear of the monies that we're spending in the gas tax, how much of it is capital? In that six cents that we're using, my understanding was that it was operating and capital mixed into the gas tax. The majority, it's, I, it's I want to know how much of that six cents is capital and how much of it is operating? Not, none of it is being trans, none of the six cents is being transferred to the capital projects fund. Okay. None so, of it. N and none of it is being used for capital. 
sidewalks can be class, sidewalk replacement can be considered to be capital. That is not done out of the transport, out of the capital projects fund. That is done out of the transportation trust fund. Okay. So the screen that you, the slide you see on the screen right now, that's representing what's happening in the transportation it's trust fund. The only thing that gets transferred out of the transportation trust fund, holistically, to support capital projects that are done through the capital projects fund, are ATMS ITS projects. That is the ninth cent specifically. Right. We're not talking about right. the ninth no, cent. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the six cents. The six cents are all for what we consider to be operations and maintenance. From a statutory standpoint, some of that classifies and can be characterized statutorily as capital. Okay. How much? I don't have that okay. figure off the top of my I'd head. Like to, I, maybe you can get that uh, for us. And, um, and I would like to just remind everybody that the structural gap that we have right now with our current funding sources for the Transportation Trust Fund is $10 million a year. That is the recurring structural gap. Yeah. That's what we're trying to address. So I think we're just going to have to figure out um, how to rethink that fund until we get some solutions. Because but, obviously, you look at that picture right there. The, the six cents is, you know, show me the picture up there again, if you can, with the six cents on there. Yeah. Um, and what you know, how we are in de from a deficit standpoint. Um, I think we so. Have this is showing the full deficit within the fund itself, currently. Currently. Right. And with this, this is showing what the different funding sources are that contribute to the total of the fund. So if we advance forward to the staff recommendation, and I understand that's not where the commission sounds like it's going right now, but if you look at the staff recommendation. This is infusing $9 million a year into that fund. This is what it does. It gets us out to FY24, and then we have another decision okay. point. And because even the $9 million a year is not enough to sustain the fund because we're already at $10 million gap per year, right. and then it grows each year. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's what I wanted to see. Um, Commissioner Long. <laughs> Thank you. I really liked a part of what Commissioner Eggers said, uh, and I agree with all of the comments about how regressive the gas tax is, um, especially as fast as the auto manufacturers are bringing electric vehicles online. I'd be very interested in um, exploring more deeply the creative solution that Commissioner Seal spoke to. Again, institutional history is really important here because if there was a way where we could do that partial rollback, as several of us have talked about, which gives some dollars back to our citizens, which I think we all care about, um, if there was a way to do that and at the same time build in to our regular budget discussion every year, the options that Commissioner Seal spoke about with regard to the ordinance, it seems to me, and we took, took the um, amount of um, reserve to cover us for this next year and worked on that solution that Commissioner Seal said, I think we could make that happen, right? We, we can do that this year. I mean, well, uh, that's, just that's the reason we prepared that rate. And so we can have a modified rate, which reduces, I mean, that is an option, we, um, we, which reduces the property tax rate down. Um, and then that money by ordinance, we can build that in. That would be dedicated to infrastructure. You could do that then, now. But that in the an meantime, option. the most important thing that I am really paying attention to for a variety of reasons and all the different boards we sit on is the fact that we don't yet know what we will, uh, what we will benefit from the new infrastructure package that's working its way through the Congress. I mean, in a, in a, at PSTA, we have heard updates every time we meet uh, from Harry about how that's playing out for us here on the local level. And I think right now we don't know that, but the solution between Commissioner Egger's comments and Commissioner Seals' comments, I think 
between those two things, we can figure that out and come out in a really good space that gives us time to more fully explore what our other options are as we begin to move forward into next year. That would be my position. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chair. Yeah, Commissioner Gerard. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to go? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner Eggers. I was curious also of that six cents, what part was actually for capital that would be transferred over to the new gas tax if we did um, address that. And what I'd like staff to do is looking at this and knowing the structural deficiency that would happen in 2024, either way, plugging it with $10 million now, what realistically would we have to do that we could do a rollback rate still, but still plan and cover through past that 2024? I, again, I think we're kicking the can down the road, which to me is, um, I mean, if you remember with every single survey that we get from our citizens, transportation and our roads is always the number one issue. It, every year since I've been here. And then, Commissioner Peters, with all due respect, I sat through budget impacts due to declining real estate values back in 2008, and it was painful. We cut 1,000 jobs out of Pinellas County, and it was not, it, it was horrific. And granted, the sky didn't fall down, and we continued to operate as a county, but it was very, very painful. Um, and I will never forget that. <clears throat> the other question I had is, given the proposed full rollback rate versus the current of the 5.2755, what kind of vote would it take from the county commission to move from the full rollback rate to the current rate in the future, if that had to take place? Oh, okay. Where, where, where is, is it? Is it a majority? Where, is it a supermajority? Where's the, where the threshold? Where's the threshold? I, I don't know if it's possible to calculate in for future years and, as, and predict for future years what the voting thresholds will be. Uh, well, we based on this year, based on those two rates, what would it take as far as a vote by the county commission? If today we were at that full rollback rate of 5.0170, and we had to vote to go to 5.2755, what kind of would, vote would it Would that trigger? So if that we trigger? had to roll up yes. instead of back? Yes. We can calculate that. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to figure out. If We so. can do that. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Gerard. <sighs> okay, it's starting to be information overload now because, <laughs> no, but I think, um, I. If you could do a quick calculation, and maybe you've already done that, about what it would take. Um, yeah, you know, I think we're all excited about the idea of doing some kind of a rollback rate, even if it's not all the way back. Uh, what would it take? Would it be a third, 25%, whatever? I think you said it was $24 million difference. Uh, between the rollback rate and the current rate. Current. So if we were going to generate nine or ten million dollars, um, it's a little more than half. Half rolled back. So. Correct. It would be rolled right. back by more than half of yeah. the full rollback rate. Yeah. Which is something we haven't been able to do for a long, long time. Um, I would be certainly in favor of that. I mean. I, the ARPA funds are going to be great when we get them, but they're one-time funds. You know, even if we have a few years to spend them, it, they're going to go away and we're still going to be stuck. So I, I'm sure we have a, a laundry list of projects we can do with that, but I don't think we rely on that for ongoing, you know, maintenance and operations. Commissioner Peters. Thank you. Um, I, you know, just, just to be clear, Commissioner Steele, I was the mayor of a city in 2008 through 2012, and I had to go through the same difficult decisions. And I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing the naysaying, naysaying, but um, 
Uh, Bill, I'm going to have a couple questions for you. So last year you projected we were going to make $31 million to go into reserves. How much do you know how much we actually are going to collect? Property tax wise, it is exactly, it's pretty well what we equivalent predicted. It's a little bit more because we have to budget 95%, but we estimate for the forecast every year, and what we're expecting to collect is consistent with the forecast. Okay, so there's no surprises that happened in property okay. tax. Because Mike Twitty, when he presented here, said it ended up being about an 8 to 9% higher. Um, that because was of residential values. specifically. Residential specifically, okay. So, because the property values went up, we didn't get a boost. It wasn't more than $31 million? When he sets the property tax values on July 1st, yeah. the only thing that changes is the value adjustment board adjustments. And that typically will be a decrease because nobody's coming in and saying, I should be paying more property taxes. Well, that's true. <laughs> um, and, and, and I don't blame them. However, um, so, so, all right, so we raised $31 million that didn't pay for a bill. It went into reserves. And if we go to the full rollback rate, that means we'll still collect that $31 million, correct? In terms That's of? That's correct. So the amount of money that you're going to collect is going to be, if you go to the full rollback rate, will be the exact amount of money that you collected last year, correct? Not factoring in new construction. Yeah. New construction, okay. we are collecting more for new construction. Okay, so, so we'll just stay with the $31 million. So last year we collected $31 million that went strictly into reserves and didn't pay a bill. If we go to the rollback rate, we collect that same extra $31 million. Now, granted, we're going to spend it on cameras for the sheriff. And, we're going to spend it on some money. Um, and if you've kept your budget the same, which I thought you were other than the sheriff's additional, what's the sheriff actually costing us? Because it sounds to me like even at the rollback rate, we're going to have significant reserves. No, we, we, we put that money in reserves. We cut our cost. Uh, we did not cut law enforcement costs. So, so he still had salary increases for his deputies. He still had, you saw some, um, a, a couple packages. This year, we, we funded body cameras, which has an ongoing cost of four and a half million dollars a year. Right. Mental health unit, you know, for his right. group. Um, and then we had some cost increases um, that for like parks. So for putting more into parks. So we had some cost increases. We've held our expenses uh, down, but we did put a little bit of that back. But you still have salary increases from both last year and this right. year. So, so, um, so not all the 31, some, some of the 31 million is, is captured. We've held okay. our, our costs down, but not eliminated. So I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to kind of do that yeah, number, right? I, so the sheriff's, the sheriff's package and the 3%, what is that total? Is that like 15 million? I'd have to look to build to get those types of numbers off okay, the top of my head. Okay, so, I, and I don't know if you know that. So, so, so we what were I'm able, asking for. I mean, to, to your point, we were able to live within that as a rollback rate, except for, and, and project out for the next several years. So a full ball rollback rate, the way we came up with that recommendation was, we're taking as an essence the 31 million, we're capturing salary increases, healthcare increases, things like that, um, and some of these program packages and be able to live with that over this two-year period. Right, okay. and you'll still have reserves that's going to be added to the reserves as a result of that, right? Well, we won't add to the reserves, all. but, but, but we're, we're using some of that for one-time money. We're putting $4 million into sidewalks, for instance, to get rid of that backlog. Um, so either way, we were able to capture that on an ongoing basis. Okay. All right. But I'm, what I'm looking for, and if you can help me on this later, is what was the increase? Because you were keeping everything at the same, and we know it's the sheriff. We know it's the 3% uh, salary increase, um, $4 million for sidewalks. So, you know, I'm still thinking you're coming up with $20 million, which probably leaves $11 million that's still going to go in reserves. Is that correct? Well, it was it was money from reserves last year, um, and so that stays there. So we have we have stable reserves. We're spending down some for one-time cost, like we said last year. We had to pay the sheriff, then we had to build in ongoing operating. So it was a setup, okay. four and a half million, right. ongoing four and a half million. Okay. Um, so uh, that because that was unanticipated. Uh, for instance, we're looking at his helicopter is uh, replacement. That's six million. Okay. So. So okay. we've, you know, so there's several one-time monies, but we can crosswalk that for you to kind of show you the the reserves and, and exactly where that's right. going. And our reserves are what, at about a six month now or three months? Where are we at? Three, six months. Where so first of all, our general fund reserve level that's budgeted for this current fiscal year, FY21, versus what we've proposed for FY22 is decreasing from 161.8 million 
to 152.5 million. Okay. So as Barry said, we are using one-time dollars to support specific projects that is decreasing our total reserve level in the general fund as proposed. That's with the full rollback rate. In addition to that, as far as the sheriff goes, um, as Barry said, we've got uh, the body cameras, which is four and a half million dollars with recurring impact. We have the sheriff vehicles. We're building that in as a recurring impact moving forward and paying off the $11 full debt. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, you've got the sheriff mental health squad. You've got the marine safety um, all, and the helicopter uh, repairs. And future, we know that is going to be coming the helicopter replacement. On top of that, the sheriff is also given a target, which is commensurate with inflation. So that increases his total budget as well. So the sheriff has increases in many different areas, but that's all built into still maintaining a reserve level as currently constituted at 21.7%, which is above our target, okay. and at $152.5 million. That's what gives us comfort with saying we can go to the full rollback rate. That's before trying to build in nine or more million dollars a year for transportation okay. trust on a recurring basis moving forward. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you. I just want to be clear on all that. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just, I heard some numbers thrown around. It was a, a $24 million property tax decrease versus a $14, $15 million uh, gas tax increase. Is that countywide? Correct. Is that? The $15 million would have been countywide. Right. Correct. And the $24 million is property tax decrease if we did the staff recommendation. Um, and but, that would have supported the cities as well. Just, right. Just to be clear, that's the reason that it was $15 million as opposed to the $9 million that we're talking about now, which is the 60% that we would have capped out of a $0.05 cent local option fuel tax. Well, what we really haven't talked about is that, that level of service. If we, don't, if we did the full rollback and we don't do the gas tax, uh, what's that push our roads and sidewalks back how many years and those kind of things as far as actual physical impact. Um, but I think the, the slotted fund I just think is a dangerous, it, it, it'll be like a state uh, housing trust fund that we rate every year when we need to, um, when budget needs, when we want to increase the level of service in our parks or we have something over here we want to do that year. I, I just think a future county commission would rate that fund in a heartbeat. But. Um, it's an interesting conversation when we're talking about increasing personnel and, and certain things in parks and other departments, um, but still want to do no tax increase and no and a full rollback. It doesn't well, all add up at the end of the day, I don't think. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I we keep forgetting that we reduced, for the Board of Commissioner Departments, we reduced our expenses. And, and that's the key to being, it's really a shifting of priorities. What we've been trying to do, as we've said before, is to reduce our expenses to align with what you have stated are your priorities into your strategic plan. Um, if you look at the three-year period, the Board of Commissioner Departments have went up on our expense side by 0.7% over a three-year period. That enables us to fund mental health units. That enables us to uh, fund the law enforcement pieces. Uh, that enables us to address the level of service in parks that you told me three years ago was insufficient. So. Um, that's how we're trying to accomplish that is through um, tightening our belt and reducing our expenses. It's very hard to do that on the sheriff's side. I mean, it's a people business, you know, it's a, it's a you know, jail deputy, it's a road officer. And so uh, that is the other half of the general fund that is, is much more difficult to do. And, and at the end of the day, I think the budget that's been proposed is is about, in my, for me, is almost there, but not quite. Because um, most of what we do here is we do lurk, we, we do try to look long term and make things sustainable. Um, I would argue, and I think everybody sitting around this room would, and the people out here watching and our residents know that this past year and this year right now that we're in is not normal. It's not anything that we've ever been through before. And so to me, um, while I might agree with all of the comments that are being made in terms of this, these kind of graphs and showing how we do going forward, I want a solution for this year for our residents. 
okay, that doesn't give take money out of their or give them money back in one pocket and take money out of their pocket. And we, remember, we haven't talked about our utility increases as well that are a, a part of this budget. So. I, when I asked, I had asked Bill for an, an exercise, and it's difficult, and I really appreciate, by the way, Bill, your the effort to do that, but it was trying to come up with a $175,000 taxable home and what they might be experiencing this coming year, right now with this budget. Um, and it turns out that because of the utilities, because of the gas tax, we were actually taking more money out than putting back for this year, and I just think with all the things that are going on and all the difficulties people are having with jobs and mortgages and rents, et cetera, that this is a, a time to symbolically say enough for this year. And so that's, that's all I'm saying. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into arguing about those numbers and about the reserve levels, because we have money. We have $3 million in our reserves that we can do one time to offset this year for that shortfall in that account. Okay. Um, and I'm just saying, I'm not saying it makes sense going forward. I'm saying mm -hmm. we've, got to, we've got to make a statement. Um, and I think the rollback rate helps. I think telling people we're not going to increase your gas tax this year helps. I think all of that is significant. And, and you know, to us sitting around here, maybe it's symbolic. I don't know. But to people out there that are trying to make ends meet, it's not just symbolic. And I think we just need to think a little bit more this year along that dimension. That's all I'm saying. So. Commissioner Gerard. Right. I don't think it's symbolic at all. I think we're rolling back, well, what we're talking about is rolling back the property tax rate and not doing anything with the gas tax. Agreed. I think that's pretty significant, it's something we haven't done for a long time. And I had some numbers that I scribbled down because I found it amazing and the sheriff's budget. $13 million increase in vehicle debt payments, $8.5 million increase in, uh, I think that was the mental health unit, increase in the mental health unit, $3.5 million for the body cameras. It adds up, and I, and I forgot to write something down about the Marine unit that's expanding. It's at least $25 million, and I, 26 sticks in my mind for some reason. Increase from one year to the next, aside from salary increases. So, you know, if we want to look at skinny and down the budget, maybe we need to look at the sheriff's office. Anybody else? Uh, Barry, did you have anything? Okay. No, I, I think from a, from, a, from a direction standpoint, the reason we're, we wanted to get this discussion on early it's because we have all of our, our, our budget meetings scheduled here in September. We have to set the uh, maximum millage rate, I think, tomorrow. Um, today. And so um, today, today, um, today. <laughs> so, so we, we need, and again, and for the public, whatever we set as our maximum millage rate is not what we can do. We just, if we say it's this amount, um, that you can set it at anything that amount or less come when you set the budget, um, but you can't go over that. And so we want to err on the side of, a, of, the, of this advertisement in terms of a, a higher amount and then um, come back. If what I'm hearing through today's discussion is that there's not support uh, for the loft, well then we would have set the rate um, at a higher amount, which I, we can do, and then you can have your meetings here in September and decide ultimately, and you can vote at that time. And I would simply take off. If there's not support for the loft, I'll take that off and not have that vote on the 24th um, because my simple math says there's not support to do that. <laughs> so if, if that's the case, I'll be, you know, that'll just save us one, one vote. But, I, but I, that's the direction we really need today. Yeah, Commissioner Peters. So is, um, are we taking a vote on this? No, um, it's just, then, yeah, I just need, I, so I can set the maximum I millage mean, rate. If, uh, if there's no support, I'll just take, on, I was gonna bring to you on the, on the 24th, whether or not you had the votes for the loft or not, and if it was 4-3, then you know, I, I need to have that vote. That way I can set the actual rates as part of the budget hearings here in September. So, if there's no support for that, I won't have that vote, and I'll adjust it to the millage rates, 
and then in turn you can set that rate after we have our additional discussions here in September. So it sounded to me like we had consensus on the 5.129 um, and we could always go back to the full rollback rate in September, right? You, you could, and, and if we go on the millage side, you just will not have the option for the, um, for the loft because I won't adjust the millage rates high enough um, to, well, I, I so, guess you could, could. Okay, so I, it was my understanding that to get that $9 million, we'd have to roll it back to a 5.129. Um, full rollback rate was a 5.0170. And I also heard some discussion about setting it maybe a little higher to where it doesn't run out in a couple of years. I can run, I can run some models to talk about if, if, we ha if it has an inflationary factor over the next several years how that makes it. So I can set the, the, the rate a little higher um, and then again, we can adjust it back to that or you know whatever when we, after we run some of those models and you consider that here in September, if that's okay. Commissioner Gerard. Okay, I'm a little confused, we, but we have to set a maximum millage rate when? Today. 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 <laughs> so we have to vote on it. No, you do not no, have to vote on to it. Vote. We, we, we can okay. set that. We have the authority to set that. What I'll set that at is at the uh, 15 million, and that gives us some room mm -hmm. uh, to where if you choose the 9 million, well, then that's a lower amount. But I have to set it at the maximum amount if that's okay. Yeah, I was going to suggest halfway back, okay. whatever that is. I don't have to. We'll, we'll build out the models so that you can see. It. You already know what 9 million looks like. What would it look like if it was 10 million? What would it look like at 11 million, at 12 million? So you can okay. see how far out can we extend that sustainability for this And fund. we'll build in that if we increase the rate each year, that it has that you know cumulative impact over the next several years. If Just like the state gets their automatic increase on their gas tax that we do not, um, that so you know we'll factor that in also on, on the property tax side. So if we're if we're good with that, that's really the direction I needed for today. So so you're talking about the maximum uh, millage rate being halfway between the current and the the full rollback. Is uh, that what I would suggest is that, w and this is not to say that it's, uh, but uh, we use the 15 million because we have that rate. Um, it'll likely be lower. I understood because it's not a transfer to the, to the cities, but we would use the 15 million whatever that rate is, we'll set that as the maximum rate, and then we'll have discussions and I'll, and I'll run models to show you what the, the partial rollback, the nine million, and then I'll show you how that is impacted over the next several years at, to, be, to show you the health of the um, transportation trust fund, and then you can set the rate that you're comfortable with here in, at the September meetings. That, that, will give you, <clears throat> that will give you flexibility while we're working those models. A very rough calculation shows that about 12 million will get us out to FY31, but that's a very rough calculation. We want to make sure we can do our diligence on it and make sure that that calculation is actually correct before we bring that back to you and have you make a decision based on that. Uh, okay. Commissioner, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, whatever number you set it at is fine until we get to the point where we're having a real discussion on it. Um, even if you set it at the current level, we're going to still reduce it at some point. So it, as long as there's enough cushion there to where we can make some real decisions at our next. The question I had, Mr. Chairman, was that um, it, it sounds like we're maybe a little further off on our budget than what I thought we were, uh, maybe just the revenue side, not the expenditure side. Is that is our calendar still lining up as far as meetings and decision points? Everything's still good? Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, whether you whether you want to use one-time money and and not address the the uh, covering the infrastructure cost into the rate, um, or whether you want to address that as part of this year's budget, we'll, we'll adjust the rate at the at the end of the day. Either way, you can always go down. So this gives us the ability to address it, and if the votes aren't there to uh, to um, address that, then we would adjust it accordingly. And I, I think it's interesting. It goes into. Uh, conversations we had in Tallahassee 10 years, 15 years ago now about uh, property taxes and, and when there was a boom of sales on homes and and um, three houses next to each other, one was bought point A, one house was bought point B, and 
and they're paying three drastically different levels of property taxes, um, which is why I'm so glad that for someone who's been in the same house for over 20 years now, <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we still have Save Our Homes because I just pulled up my, my tax rate and it's not anywhere near uh, valued at the average Pinellas County home uh, right now. So there's, there's relief for that. But um, anyway, I'll leave it for that. Thank you. Okay, so I, I guess what I'm, oh, Commissioner Flowers, I'm sorry, go ahead. Apologize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I just want to remind anyone who may be viewing this um, that when we discussed going to the rollback rate, that wasn't a firm decision. That was a discussion with um, some variables that were presented by staff that if we did that, here is what um, we would get as a result of that. Um, all of us have served in government for quite some time, and I just want to be very careful about uh, looking at how much we have in reserves right now. That was a very smart move by the commissioners when the decision was made um, to go ahead and generate that revenue in anticipation of potentially a bad future happening. So that was really good planning. But now we're having conversations, and they are one-time costs, but it's not just the sheriff's office. We had SOE come in here because they had a decision package mm -hmm. for things that they needed. We had a lot of, uh, we had BTS come in here. We're looking at, you know, how we're going to handle that Opus uh, um, uh, system um, to expand it and make sure it's doing what it needs to do. We're going to be looking at the human resources department and, and looking at new software in their department. So it's there are many different requests that were made, and we kept veering the funding sources to come from our reserves. Um, and so I just want to make sure that through all of the discussion and decision making, even though they are one-time costs, at any point in time, because we are a peninsula on a peninsula, we could have some serious concerns where we'll need to then make provisions to our county residents, but we may or may not have the financial funding to actually take care of those um, needs. I do believe in giving residents a break any time that we can, um, but in saying that, we have a, a moratorium that was just lifted. I am grateful for the dollars that we have for eviction <clears throat> mitigation or for rental assistance. But we're going to have many more, as a result of the moratorium ending, we're going to have many more people putting forward eviction notices now that the moratorium has been lifted. So they're going to be looking at what programs and services we have to help and within the cities. So it's just a lot of variables mm -hmm. that we have right now that I just don't want us to look at how much money we have right now, how much we have in reserves right now, because that may not be the case depending on the needs of our residents going forward, even through 2024. So I just kind of wanted to say that because yeah. <clears throat> all of us, I know uh, Commissioner Peters was mayor of Pasadena, I think. Um, I was on city council in 07 when it was horrendous. Um, and then leaving city council, going to the school board, where the Pinellas County School still has not caught up to its level of funding of where it was in 2007. Um, and, and they're still paying the price for it when they're making funding decisions in 2021. So that's the only reason why I'm saying this. I'm sorry if I'm being long-winded, but I just know I've worked through two forms of government one where we were able to figure it out and make it work. We had to lay people off. We had to reduce services to the public. And a lot of people were upset with that. On the school side, where we had to reduce services for our kids, not giving teachers pay raises, you know, not being able to upgrade our technology systems. And every day, it's penny pinching every year. Um, for the eight years I served, it was always penny pinching because we could never catch up to that 07 financial mark of where we were. So that is to your point, Commissioner Seals. If we do this, then what will it take to even get back to where we are right now? 
So I tr truly understand and feel your point. So I just, um, I, I am for looking at those targets and see how they look and setting those models. But I just wanted to share that going forward. That That's where I'm thinking, you yeah. know, where my head is. I want to give some relief, but I don't want to pinch back so much that um, we don't have what we need going forward and it'll be very difficult to get where we need because we don't know what's going to happen with the market. It is so volatile right now. It is a, a seller's market right now when it comes to home properties, not business, industrial, commercial properties. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, and I, you know, again, I think, you know, this is a, obviously a, a challenging time um, for all of us. And in, in perspective, I'd also ask um, Bill to tell me, you know, the number of employees that we anticipate having in our budget this coming year and how far back in time we had to go to have this hit the same number of employees. And though we've had some increases along the way and some decreases, as you pointed out, uh, where we are today is about the same level, I think, as we were in 1990. 1990, I think, is what you... 8990, that's correct. And yeah. that'll be in the next presentation. Yeah. And so I think it's, I mean, from a perspective, all the discussion that we're having here today, I think our residents need to know, first of all, not, not this commission, but past commissions have done a pretty good job of main, watching our growth. And when we, and we had to have that, we had that unfortunate, but correction in 2007, 2008, uh, but we're, we're doing okay there. What we're trying to do, we just, and I don't think any of us are messaging differently, really, if we're trying to be sensitive to our residents, not only in the near term, the next three to five years, but also this year, and what that means to our residents this year in actual dollars versus, um, and I, 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 I say symbolic, but it's, it's really significant to us, but it's also significant to our residents. So. Barry, what I'm hearing, though, is we're not going to be addressing um, the gas tax in, on August 24th. And Correct. that we are setting a maximum millage. That's the consensus you're getting. Yep. That's halfway. 15 million. Um, 15 million. Th then we can adjust instead down Instead of the 24 choose. million d decrease, a, a millage it, rate that sets a 15 million decrease versus the 24. Is that what we're, I just want to make sure I know what we're, Actually, it's it'd be a nine million dollar decrease. It'd be a nine million dollar sure decrease. Make sure we have the capacity for up Correct. to fifteen So that would be million. the maximum and, rate. And, and again, that is not what. The, yeah, that's just you. setting the maximum. We'll adjust it from there. So provides and, us flexibility Correct. for other decisions in the next month. And what we'll do, to you know, Commissioner Flowers' concerns, and some of you have raised the same concern. There's a lot of variables that go into this budget. Um, looking at you know our cybersecurity looking at all these other things that we, we don't necessarily talk about here, but they're, they're built into the, all the hearings that you've heard and the different you know, pieces that you set in on. Um, we've got a, we actually have a, um, a program um, that, that factors in and we can project out um, year after year. And here's, the, here's all, those, some, all those impacts. And, and so we look at, assumptions that say we'll still be healthy in 2026, 2027. And so I'll ask Bill to pull that up and kind of show you that at the next meeting. And I think that'll alleviate some of the concerns that you've raised that those, all those different factors are being considered as part of the overall um, health of our funds. Yeah, that's a good idea. And, and maybe as we think to our legislative meetings in the fall that we can talk a little bit of the state of our gas tax fund and some of the issues, I'm sure they're looking at too, but that we're, that we're concerned about over the next five years and continue to put, you know, make that an important point for us to transmit to our, okay. our delegation. Continue to we do that. Do I don't mean that we haven't done it before, but let's continue to highlight the, the, the important issues that we seek going forward, and which I'm sure is shared by many counties. So, it, it, it's been a yeah. fact priority for years. Yeah. yeah. Right. Anything else on this issue item? Okay. Thanks. <laughs> He's not done yet. Well, you, you can beat him up a few more times here in September. Yeah. So, so um, we're going to item three. Item three. We don't need a presentation on the maximum millage rate. We just got the direction on that. Do you? Uh, I think it might be a good idea to go through it because it's more than just the general fund millage rate. Um, and then also, uh, there are, to, to your point, 
um, about where are we at from a multi-year perspective, building in some of the things that we know and expect are coming, what does the general fund forecast look like? Because that is built into this uh, presentation. So we could at least start that conversation. Um, so as far as the maximum millages, and I'll run through this pretty quickly. So uh, as we know, we have to set the maximum millages uh, per state statute. Uh, we can decrease at any time we want past there. Uh, proposed millage reductions, uh, we talked about the general fund already. Um, that is, this would be the first voluntary decrease in the general fund millage since FY07. Uh, we were mandated by the state to roll back in FY08, as you all are familiar with and we talked about. The health department millage, we are proposing to do a full rollback rate on that. That hasn't been rolled back voluntarily since FY97. We have eight of the unincorporated fire districts that we're proposing a rollback rate. Uh, that rollback rate was calculated in coordination with the fire chiefs in each of those districts, uh, looking at not only what their operations are, but also what their future capital needs are. Uh, so we're all on the same page and comfortable with these rollback rates that are some are full rollback rates, some are partial rollback rates. The general fund forecast that we just talked about a little bit. Uh, this is the reason we have comfort with going to the, with, without the transportation piece, going to the full rollback rate. Because as you can see, we're healthy into FY27. Health department uh, fund forecast, also healthy all the way out and be, into FY27 and beyond. That includes $2.1 million in capital planning uh, to improve facilities, things like roof replacements and generators. Commissioner Eggers, to your point and the question about where are we at from a staffing perspective, this represents the BCC staffing and you have to go back all the way to 8990 to find the same staffing levels as are proposed for FY22. I'm not gonna go through each of these individually, they're on the slides, but these are, this is a reconciliation of the changes for the BCC, your departments, uh, that are the changes. The net impact is a total increase of 16.1 FTE for FY22. This reconciles where those are going. And as far as next steps, uh, as we talked about today, we need to certify with the property appraiser the maximum millage rates today. The 23rd is when the trim notices will be mailed out to property owners. The 24th, uh, obviously, we're not going to be taking that uh, local option fuel tax up on the 24th any longer, um, but we may need to continue to have discussions about what is the millage rate we'll actually put into the tentative budget. On September 7th, we need to post the tentative budget to the budget website. On September 9th, you'll have your first public hearing, so that'll be the first time that you actually vote formally on the millage rates and the associated budgets. September 24th is when you do the final adoption. And then October 1st, we start the fiscal year, and October 20th, we post it to the website, either that date or earlier. Okay. Um, real quick, could you do the FTE um, thing again for, I mean, you were, we were like in public works, uh, parks and conservation, building department, to our B, uh, BOCC uh, uh, fund, what is, the, what is the increase in FTEs? It's 16.1 FTEs in total. That's the net increase that you're gonna see between FY21 and FY22 based on the proposed budget. And the vast majority of that being parks. And, and it looks like five of them going from temporary employees to permanent em uh, yeah, we, contract. We, we have, we we have, have a couple areas. Too. Yeah, we have a couple areas where they've had temporary employees on for five years. Um, and, you know, with the turnover in that, so it's a no net cost or maybe the cost of benefits, but it's a very small cost and just bringing them on full time. We've in essence had that workload being performed for a number of years. Is that part of the 16? Yes, it is. Okay, so aside from that, which shows a smaller increase, right? Yeah. Then there's 11, 11 new FTEs. If you want to back those out. I'm just correct. trying to understand what the, you know, when you increase a, a job, that's a, a whole lot different than just that temporary to permanent. Yeah, um, the vast majority of the positions are really over at the parks. Some of those are new, or several of those are new because we were increasing the service level in parks. And then we had a few positions over in safety and emergency services. Some of those are not general fund. So for instance, you know, um, looking, working with our 
um, fire departments is you know one of them. So, um, and I'm curious about the building and development review. The three positions there, the 3.2. What is that? Very. I mean, um, that that are that's actually we we did that this past year. Um, this current budget that we're in. We, we, we did this with current budget, we just didn't fund it. We funded it with um, by holding positions open, uh, but this is really what that backfills. Um, that is our permit coordinators um, okay. to improve that process. So there, when somebody walks in and you, you get sent around to five different departments, now you're gonna deal with one person that coordinates and helping you get through that process. Okay, so um, it was funded a certain way in this current budget, so the that's why there's the increase for next. That's correct. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Seal. Uh, yes, uh, Bill, could you pull up the um, maximum millage summary that was also in our um, agenda? Uh, we'll have to ask the uh, folks in the back if they can pull up the second attachment. That was it shows on the, uh, the voting threshold, and I just thought yes. it would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, this year we have EMS, um, East Lake Library, and Recreation, and Tierra Verde Fire that'll require two thirds vote to pass those budgets. That's correct, and that's pretty pretty, pretty common. Standard. It's pretty common that we have a couple of uh, districts that do require two thirds vote. Um, it's a very strange formula, I'll just say that. It's complicated, mm -hmm. and you couldn't possibly predict it if you wanted to, which ones are gonna be two-thirds and which ones aren't in any given year. Okay, thanks. So, but it's um, not the fire district, you're not talking about that, because those are all decreases, right? Uh, Tierra Verde Fire, fire district, district requires a two-thirds two vote to approve the proposed millage. Oh, any? And that proposed millage is the same millage, right? We're not proposing a rollback for Tierra Verde. Okay. So that takes one anyway. It takes two thirds. That one takes two thirds to keep the same millage rate, which is what we're proposing. Okay. All right. That's all we have on item number two, commissioners. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's move on to item three. Thanks, Bill. Item number three is, um, so we have uh, Cynthia Johnson here uh, to give you an update, and it's been some time since we've been able to uh, provide an update on our small business enterprise activities, and so uh, Cynthia will come forward and uh, provide you an update. Good morning and welcome. Good to have you here. Good morning. I have my partner in crime here with me today. Good morning, I'm Cynthia Johnson with Economic Development, the Office of Small Business and Supplier Diversity. Uh, this morning, I'm going to share with you all a brief update of where our SBE, is, SBE program is up to date. So, can you get that from Nicole? Thank you. So our, our office's core values kind of guide and support the implementation of our SBE program. But as you all know, we don't do the program in isolation. We don't do it by ourselves. So I've asked Paul Giuliani uh, from Public Works. He is the construction manager, division director to join me today. Paul is my staff partner. He works with me on every CIP project to ensure that we have reasonable goal expectations put on the SBE projects. Together, we both work with the project managers and with the SBEs to make sure that they have the resources in um, activity and support inside and out to make sure that they are successful. The SBE Collaborative, this slide is very interesting. Last year, we started an SBE Collaborative. And the idea behind the Collaborative is to offer vendor development support, equitable economic development, outreach, and to communicate with all of these partners about activities that our SBEs can join with their organizations. This collaborative is a, um, a group of professionals 
that support minority and small business development throughout the Tampa Bay area. So last year, our regional partners, we were at five. This year, we have grown this collaborative to 19 partners. We have quarterly meetings, and during those quarterly meetings, we do knowledge sharing, and we do um, vendor development, and we do uh, sustainability activities to support the SBEs. So I'm sure you want to know what's happening with the SBEs. So next, I'm going to share with you a very brief slide to show you the SBEs in action. So if I can have the slide, please, the video. The SBE program means the Small Business Enterprise Program. And it is a race and gender neutral program that Pinellas County has implemented to help diversify our supply chain by utilizing small businesses to help us procure our goods and services. We're out here at Sand Key Park on a construction project, a pretty big project as you can see, lots of paving and drainage and roadway work going on. We have around, uh, we have around six projects uh, with Pinellas County right now. And this project for the Sankey project, we're doing, uh, we're fixing the bad roads and we're putting new curb. A small business may also contribute by performing public outreach tasks such as cores into the pavement, laying out the plans and the design, producing the bid contract documents for a project such as this paving project. It's a success to Luis and his his business. He, he started out small. He's a pretty good sized prime now. He also employs uh, small businesses out here also. I get excited because I know in 2018 when we started this journey to re-engineer the program, we had about 41 vendors in our database. And as of today, we have over 715 vendors in our database. Not only do we have vendors, we are actually awarding contracts. For my uh, business to be awarded a contract is huge, especially being a small business and starting out. It allows us to not only scale our business, but it allows us to employ people. The current projects that I have, one with the Pinellas County, also the City of St. Pete and Tampa Airport. In 2019, we awarded over $7.5 million in contracts. And I'm so proud to announce that in 2020, although we had a pandemic and we had to all pivot, Pinellas County awarded over $20 million in contracts to small businesses. It's important to create opportunities for smaller firms because they're really the backbone of everything we have. Uh, everyone really starts from a small firm, even the biggest firms start from small. Creative Contractors started over 45 years ago. We started out as a small firm just doing storefront renovations. We understand what it takes for a small company to start and grow over time. We seek out trying to help smaller businesses, so our success is dependent on all the companies that help us. We found with small firms, uh, we're able to share the wealth. The SBE Collaborative is a group of professionals from the area. Most of us are in procurement or economic development or supplier diversity, and we get together and share information and best practices to enhance and grow and support the SBE community in the region. One of the things I like most about my experience at the SBDC so far is their willingness to tell us when we're wrong. We're knocking on the doors, but we're knocking on the wrong doors. You know, if it wasn't for the resources and the information and the staff at um, SBE, we wouldn't know where to look for it. We wouldn't know that we're going to the wrong places. So I know for me, information, you know, is the, uh, the biggest resource. So we don't just leave our businesses out there when they become an SBE with us. We support them with small business development center services. We have consultants that actually work with those businesses. We're becoming more informed more empathetic, more intelligent as leaders in public service. And it benefits the organization in that way, which benefits the whole community. That's, that's really what everybody wants, is for us to, to come together, learn together, be better. I think it's beneficial to be part of the SBE Collaborative, because we get to look at it from a lot of different perspectives, sharing the knowledge that each group has. 
Now what does this mean to us? That means new jobs. That means being able to pay college tuition, being able to go to the grocery store, to pay your mortgage. We're making sure that we are a part of the economy and we are creating opportunities for our small businesses to be successful here in Pinellas County. Well, as you can see, our SBEs are busy. Paul and I, uh, we spend a lot of time together. I tell them I owe him lunch and breakfast for today. But we spend a lot of time together really supporting our SBEs, making sure that they have the tools to be successful. Uh, as you all have instructed us, this is not an entitlement program. This is a program where uh, we look for the most ready, willing, and able SBEs to work with. And by having that collaborative, we're able to work with other partners. In that uh, video, you saw creative contractors. Creative contractors won a $55 million contract with us prior to us reestablishing the program. But we met with them and talked with them, and they volunteered to um, include SBEs as part of their program, and they have exceeded um, the initial expectation of like a 10%, and uh, right now they're at 11.31% of utilization of SBEs on that project. And then the other gentleman that you saw um, from Suncoast Development of Pinellas County, now that is an SBE, but he was awarded a prime contractor. He won the countywide ADA sidewalk drainage and roadway improvement contract. It's a three-year contract and it's for $14 million. And so what they're doing with that project is really, you know, you saw San Key on there, but they have hired additional SBEs to work with them on that project. And then the video was done by an SBE, um, K.W. Williams. Uh, Carrick Williams was able to come in and uh, interview Paul in the heat of the day, <laughs> in the heat of the day, along with uh, the other SBEs that we utilize. And he did that. He turned the first draft back around to us in 72 hours. So sometimes using SBEs really can help us uh, meet deadlines. So I'll just want to share with you where we are today as far as our numbers. As you heard me state earlier, we have over 740 vendors in our database. Of those vendors, we have 73 vendors who are acting as prime contractors. So uh, they have been awarded as the prime, although they are small, they are the primary contractor. And when they do that, oftentimes they hire additional subcontractors who are SVEs. As of June the 30th, we had uh, 232 active contracts valued at about 7.5 million. And we have made in this fiscal year, as of June 30th, $11.8 million in payments to those contractors. And I always like to share payments because payments is actual money in the pockets of our business owners. So with that, we continue to have outreach, even though uh, we had the pa pandemic during 2020, and right now we're stu still doing a lot of activities virtually, we still have tremendous participation. So we're doing outreach, not only externally, but we're doing internal outreach as well. Doctor, a question for you. Mm -hmm. On that $11.8 million in payments, that is directly to the small businesses that you're talking about? Absolutely. So if we pay contractors that aren't small business and they have small businesses that they've hired to do extra work that they're paying out of their contract, does that money include those those as well? Yes, it okay. does. Our uh, system, we monitor uh, all payments. Okay, so if it's on that contract, we are able to track those. Okay, so, so yes, those dollars could are included. could be directly included. from us or, or through, through, through their the prime. Sun. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Absolutely. And um, part of our departmental performance measures is the fact that when we give goals, we want to make sure that our um, prime contractors are meeting those goals. And um, 
it takes Paul, you know, it takes our, our managers, our purchasing department, our finance department, and uh, BTS and OTI are also part of the team that make this happen. And we have been able to have 100% goal attainment by every firm that's had a goal in the last year. They have met that goal at 100%. And more importantly, they have actually, about 70% of those firms have actually um, reported their compliance within 30 days. That's a real big deal to us on our end to have them to report that compliance so quickly. So what's next for the SBE program? Well, as with any program, when we're looking to offer continuous improvement so that we uh, allow our citizens to receive the best services that we have to offer through our small businesses, we come across some challenges, and we've had a few challenges with making sure that we have consistency in the implementation of the policy. So that has caused us to pivot in some areas of maybe rewriting some policy, rewriting some of our contracts where we have language that's more specific to what we need to do. and. Um, making sure that internally we are all on the same page and we're following the, following the SOPs that we have put in, in place along with Paul's team. We've met with Kelly and her team and all of the uh, project managers to make sure that we are continuously working together to improve the program. So with that, a couple of the things that we have uh, on the horizon for the program is definitely continued vendor development. We have been working with Pinellas County Technical, Pinellas Technical College uh, to ensure that we have a construction apprentice program that we should be able to roll out by the end of this fiscal year. And currently, as a matter of fact, on August the 15th, we are starting our mentor protege pilot program that we have uh, with the University of South Florida. It's a program we're doing with Skanska. We have 15 members from the Tampa Bay region and Pinellas County has three of our small businesses participating in that program. The other item that we're doing is the SBE project mapping. We're working with BTS and OTI to develop a GIS mapping where we can place all of the SBE activity across the county and you can just you know, hover over the map and see what's going on. And then we have our newsletter, an upcoming newsletter where we will showcase vendor opportunities, we'll showcase vendors um, who have uh, successes, and then we'll also be providing in that newsletter highlights on resiliency, uh, highlights on how to make sure that their businesses are sustainable and highlights on opportunities from all of our SBE collaborative partners. So in fiscal year 2022, which is next year, we'll be entering into our final stages of our initial three years of implementation of the program. And at that time, uh, we'll be coming back to the board requesting recommendations for our next steps for the program. So we would like to invite each of you to participate in our 2021 reverse trade show. Uh, we have done this in the past in, in present, in, 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 in person, but of course due to COVID, uh, we have um, planned ahead and decided to do it virtually in 2021 as we did in 2020. So that event will happen on the 15th. It's an opportunity where we have about 35 local government and industry partners come and provide their opportunities and we match them in private rooms. We have pull out sessions. We match those uh, opportunities with the vendors that we have registered. And lastly, I just want to say you know, this has been a partnership that has been ongoing and it really has allowed us internally as staff to work together on projects that we normally 
wouldn't work together on because prior to the SBE, I didn't know Paul, but now he's like on my speed dial. <laughs> and, uh, and then we get to sit in meetings that Public Works is having. We sit in all of the construction pre-bid meetings. We participate in that. We're uh, making sure that it is a full service program and not just a program where we're recruiting SBEs and we lead them out there to, you know, um, figure it out for themselves. They do have the full support of county. And then lastly, I just want to say um, it has been absolutely wonderful to work with our project managers. The project managers, you know, I had a little resistance at first. Uh, we still have some that we have to coach along, but for the most part, they have been wonderful to work with. And not just uh, from our perspective, but the SBEs are telling us as well, you know, I was a little afraid to work with the county. You guys are so big. But Paul came out and he showed me how I can make things work or, you know, those kind of conversations are the conversations that we want the program to be reflective of. We want them to have sustainable businesses that are re resilient and can take a hit or can take a success and still be around in years to come. So that's my report on the uh, state of where we are with our small business enterprise program. Paul, you want to add anything else? Okay. It's like, you got me on the camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Paul, I just need you to go out. It's not going to be that hot. And then it turned out to be a really hot day. So I appreciate you, Paul. Any questions for Dr. me? Dr. Johnson, Paul, thank you. Um, it's great work. Um, how, how did, would you say, overall, those, those vendor partners that we had, how did they um, survive, sustain themselves? You talk about sustainability for them over the last year during this, these difficult times? You know, it, it has been uh, one of the most interesting thing is to work with that SBE collaborative because we all have had to be innovative. And because we uh, work in this arena, a lot of the ways that we have been able to survive is working in partnership and not doing things in isolation. And a clear example is PSTA. In February, PSTA uh, wanted to do something to support the community, and you know, Al was like, "What should I do?" And I said, "Well, we have an arts community. You know, maybe we can incorporate art into PSTA. And if you were around, they wrapped the buses with some of the murals that we had in St. Pete. So they used a small business to do that. And so we exchange ideas, and that really is the beauty of the of the collaborative. It helps us exchange ideas of how to support." especially in uh, uncertain times when consistency and tradition may not necessarily work in the environment that we have to adjust to. Commissioner. Um, super kudos, because um, Barry know I've been like, when are we going to get an update? Um, <laughs> because I didn't get the update you know, prior. So super kudos to everybody um, within the department. And Paul, now I get to see your wonderful face as well. Um, Ms. Ziplin that was up there, um, seeing her um, have an opportunity for a contract at the airport, uh, historically it's been very difficult for minorities to get contracts because of A, the competition, and the amount of financial security you have to have within your business um, when you apply for those bids. But based on all of the hard work from our department um, and cooperation with TIA and PIE, PIE um, we've been able to, small businesses have been able to kind of jump over those hurdles and have a chance to receive those types of contracts so that now they can go out and bid for larger contracts because larger contracts, they want to know what's your historical perspective, what kind of work have you done or have you done work, you know, in this area. So now they get a chance to do that and to see um, the partnership with vendors um, that are larger corporations partnering with smaller. Creative uh, is the one who gained the contract to mm -hmm. build Melrose Elementary School. And you all have heard my story about how they help minority vendors there. So persons that live right down the street or in the community were able to work on that project. Um, so then you go out and you say positive things about this company and it just helps all around. 
and then to be able to pay living wages above living wages to those individuals helps the economy because now people are able to take care of themselves and pay their rent or mortgage or what have you. So I'm just really excited. I see us growing. Um, I just sent an email to Darlene. I want to be on the Zoom for this and just kind of hear the ideas and whatnot. But super kudos to the staff as well as Pinellas County's own internal departments mm -hmm. who themselves have opened themselves up to say, we'll also use SBEs. It doesn't make sense for us to push the utilization of SBEs in the community, but we don't use them within Pinellas County government. So um, I'm just really excited for this report. The numbers look very, very encouraging. And I just see us uh, growing from this point um, because for some communities, small businesses are what really is the engine for the community. So thank you. Yeah, I think it's great that you, you know, you're opening the eyes of some of our bigger contractors too in, in trying to find good subcontractors to work yeah. is sometimes difficult. And they're out there, but sometimes, you know, you just, it's the easy way just to, with the ones you've been dealing with all along, which is great. But at the same time, there be, there's other ones now that they can look at. And I think it's expanded their horizon as well. And I think that's a, that's a positive thing. Um, and it does help a lot of small businesses. So, Mr. Justice. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And just to, to add on to the praise fest we got going this morning, <laughs> um, to Mr. Giuliani and Dr. Johnson, to go from 41 vendors to 740 vendors, I don't know what a hundred, how many hundred percent increase that is, but uh, to have all of that amount of increase in our local employers having access to these contracts and these jobs is really incredible. And a testament to the work that you've talked about through the beginning of this was not only do we need to set up this program, but we need to go out and communicate this program yeah. and educate. And you heard the one gentleman say, we just didn't know what we didn't know. Um, and how you guys are giving those access to our local employers is just outstanding. And every time I've been out to a chamber and I've mentioned this program and I, and it just is logical. It just makes sense. People yep. just kind of nod their head yep. and go, yeah, why haven't we been doing this forever? So yeah. uh, again, just really appreciate your good work. Yeah. And thank you all. We couldn't do any of this without your leadership and support. And I just want to make a comment about Elizabeth um, Siplin, who was from Impact Solutions. She actually is doing our uh, employee survey. So her company, we have a small business doing Pinellas County's employee survey that came out yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, for us to do. So it's just exciting to see how additional opportunities come uh, when we see that we have really ready, willing, and able qualified vendors to work with. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I don't see any other questions, but keep up the great work. And Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah, bye-bye now. Uh, next up, commissioners, um, you had asked about some of the um, assembly room technology, and this quickly gets above my head, so I asked Barbara to come forward and kind of explain some of the options that we have. Um, just so you know, we did order some pizzas, and they'll be here in about five or ten minutes, so um, you can kind of um, um, determine. It. I thought this would be a next quick item, and then uh, if you want to take a break, yeah, you know, we'll we'll have that available for you. Yeah, we're going to listen to this one. <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. I promise to keep it very brief. Um, so uh, obviously the presentation is uh, on the options that we have available for a request to speak solution. And as you'll recall, um, there was discussion about this at a previous board meeting. And these were some of the things that you advised would be beneficial. So finding a simple solution for the commissioners to indicate that they wish to speak on an agenda item with the push of a button. Providing the chairman a real-time system-generated list of commissioners who wish to speak on an item. Um, providing a simple way for the chairman to move through the list. Um, we heard that you prefer not to use the system that <laughs> is being used by PSDA, so we're not proposing <laughs> that. And that you also uh, prefer not to add additional screens to the commissioner's desks. So you would think that there would be a lot of options that could meet those requirements, but unfortunately there are not. <laughs> um, there really are two best solutions that we wanted to uh, put forward to you today for your consideration, and we have a staff recommendation, of course. Uh, so the two solutions that we have uh, in front of us are 
a new version of the Granicus Agenda software that we currently have. And I know in the past we had tried it. Um, it was um, a, a they, they didn't have the software update that we need, and they have advised that they will be uh, rolling it out later this year or at February, the latest. So they are coming out with a solution that would work for us. And then the other option is called a DSAN deliberator, and I'm going to show you what that looks like in a, in a moment. So option one is the new version of our current agenda software. Um, when you think about what flows more naturally as far as the, the meeting workflow and what keeps everything in one place and is easier for the commissioners to navigate, we believe that this is the best option. I'll tell you why. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they're expecting to launch an updated version of their software um, as early as October, as late as February of next year, but they are indicating that they are hopeful it will be sooner rather than later. Um, that software will run no matter what device you have, and you will be able to see a push a request to speak button right on your screen. So it would not require commissioners to have additional screens or additional places to look to press to indicate that they wish to speak. Um, the vendor is very confident that their new uh, version of the software is going to fix the problem and it'll work. Um, this solution does not add a cost or staffing needs. Um, as I mentioned, there's no additional screens or hardware that would be needed, except for the chairman obviously would have a side screen where he can see who has uh, pushed the button and who wishes to speak in the order in which they have indicated. Um, and it takes advantage of the current functionality we have, so it keeps it all in one system. And so um, in consulting with the Office of Technology and Innovation and BTI, or sorry, BTS, they indicated, and, and we also agree as a communications department, that this would be the more natural, the more intuitive solution. However, we want to give you another option and that is the next one I'm going to present on. And again, it's called DSAN Deliberator. And you have an example of what that might look like. It's a box that would be placed on the desk. So each commissioner would get a box assigned to them, and they would push the button. That button would indicate to a separate computer that we would have to get um, who wants to speak, and then the chairman would see on a screen that list. So it, it is a little more complicated, um, but you know it can do the job. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, we figured would give you a, an easy, quick comparison here. So on the left, you have the pros and cons for the Granicus. On the right, you have the pros and cons for the DSAN Deliberator. Um, I should note that the DSAN Deliberator is currently in use by the city of St. Pete. We had staff go out there and look at uh, the system. However, the way in which they use it would be different from the way in which we would use it. They already integrate a lot of meeting components into that system. So similar to us, we have Granicus to do a lot of that workflow they're using DSAN Deliberator. So with Granicus, again, no new hardware or software, no cost, no additional staffing, and it's easy to use. So no matter which location the board is meeting at, you already have your device. The device, as soon as you sign on, it will recognize it's you, and you push to speak, and the chairman will see that you know, Commissioner Flowers wishes to address uh, the board. Uh, the cons to Granicus, obviously, is we don't have a firm release date yet. They have given us a window that they're very confident about. Um, <clears throat> the user experience cannot be tested because they have not rolled it out, so I can't show you what it physically looks like. I can only describe it. Um, and it doesn't have a physical button if somebody would prefer to have that you know, separate device on their desk. It does not provide that. And then with the DSAN Deliberator, you do have that completely separate function. Um, it has a good user interface for the chairman. You know, you would still get your list. Um, and most likely could implement in October. So if your uh, guidance were that, you know, you wanted to explore the Deliberator, the earliest we could get it would be around the same time as Granicus is expected to come out with their upgrade. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, DSAN does not integrate with Granicus, and that's why it has to be monitored separately during a meeting. There's obviously an additional cost involved. We're looking at around $5,000 for an entire suite for a meeting location. Um, assuming that the board would use the Magnolia Room and eventually return to the assembly room, we could move that equipment. But if the board chose to keep a uh, meeting in two separate locations in the future, then that would be two separate systems that we would have to get. Um, each box is assigned to a commissioner, so it's not like we can just pick them and put them. We have to very carefully monitor which one is Commissioner Gerard's box and which one is uh, Commissioner Justice's box. Um, and obviously with a lot more equipment, you have a lot more opportunity for points of failure um, when you're moving them around. 
our staff recommendation is uh, to um, implement the new version that Granicus plans to roll out as soon as they have it. We'll test it, we'll see if it works. If after trying that solution, it still does not meet the needs of the board, then we can uh, take another look at the Descent Deliberator. So we are uh, welcoming your feedback. Okay, well I'm glad we're trying to come up with a solution for when Justice is the chair, because that's obviously the anticipated problem. Um, Anybody have any questions other than Commissioner uh, Justice? Yeah, Commissioner Long. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Barbara, I'm very curious as someone who uh, formerly has used and still used the system at PSTA, what were the issues with, uh, with the system at PSTA? I thought it was fabulous when I was chair. The issue was I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. All right, then. I guess that tells <laughs> me everything I need to know. I mean, it, it was self-contained in one system. You could see everything. The t you know, the, the print was a little small. Yes, we did was. hear that feedback. But we did that get that feedback. that was my only critique, really. Yeah. But it is a separate system. It's over here, and it's mm -hmm. got a box, and it's got a screen, and you got to press the... Yeah, it, for systems management, um, it's easier to just keep everything in one place, and that's why the Granica solution is the recommendation that OTI and BTS support as well as uh, we do. Um, but it would be a, a completely separate system, so in the, in the likes of getting a descend deliberator, for example. Okay. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Granicus version, is that, would that require a separate screen for the chairman, a separate iPad? Yes, both of these solutions would require a separate screen for the chairman just to make it easier for them to see who is signing up to speak. And I thought on the original, when we first got Granicus, there was a request to speak button. There was a request to speak button. However, there was a bug. So depending on which device you used, you, wouldn't, you, you might not be able to see it as you're reviewing your other items. What Granicus has advised us is that the new version that they're going to roll out, regardless of your device, you will be able to see very clearly that request to speak button and all you have to do is press it. Okay. And will the other commissioners, that screen that shows the request to speak, is that only on the chairman's screen? Or would everyone see the order of request? The chairman will be the one who has the screen that shows who has signed up and in what order. Okay. Doesn't, it doesn't seem to make any sense to spend any money on any extra equipment on this, but um, especially the chairman just ignores the buttons anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner right, Seal. Then. <laughs> oh, oh, was it you? Commissioner Gerard, <laughs> did you, either one? Of, okay, neither one of you. I was trying to go to you before I went to justice anyway. Um, Anybody else? Uh, Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, so the technology that the city of St. Pete uses, I'm familiar with that one because I use that system. And yes, you do have your laptop and you have a separate screen, but once the person pushed their light to speak, it lit up so you could see who it was. So it really wasn't um, that difficult. You also had a button where you could mute people if they went over <laughs> their time, which I used frequently when people went over their three minutes. Um, just when they went over their three minutes, that's, it, that's all. Um, but you do have the mute button. I guess he's laughing because he'll probably mute me. Um, no, just kidding. Just I don't kidding. think she meant for the commissioners, but. I know. <laughs> um, so either one, I, I like the Granicus. I mean, that's fine. We use it at PSTA. Um, and I don't think we're like super, super rushed, you know, um, and certainly don't want to spend any additional money if we don't have to. But um, I think, um, I think. Yeah, I just I suggested it just because sometimes we're all like waving, you know, like this, and the chair does his very best to, to you know, figure out who's speaking or who's next. So, <laughs> yeah, as Justice just said it was a reaction to this chairman not anticipating the next one. I get it. Uh, <laughs> no, I well, I, 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 I didn't, you know, I, I wasn't here before, so <laughs> I'm not being. Yeah. No, I, I get it. Okay. it. Sometimes, it sometimes I'm, you know, you can be very attentive to one side. You're just like, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I forgot this side yeah. exists. Sometimes. So, but thank it, you for coming back yeah. with this so quickly. That that was very nice. Yeah, I like the idea of Granicus as well. Just use what we have and do it a little bit better job with it. So that's just. Um, okay. Is that kind of what we're hearing around the table, right? Um, I don't see anybody jumping up and down for the other one, so. Okay, we'll okay. stay in touch with Granicus and we'll advise when they roll it out. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Barbara. And now we're gonna go ahead and take about a, a, a half hour break uh, for lunch. 
Uh, the, the pizzas aren't here yet. Um, they're running a little bit behind. We're still going to go ahead and take a break. Okay. A half Great. hour. And um, hopefully there'll be some time in there for some pizza. All right. They should be here in about five or ten minutes. Right. And then we'll come back for the agenda.
thanks, uh, Della, for the for lunch. Appreciate that. And um, we'll go ahead and get back. We're going to go through the agenda for next Tuesday. Uh, Barry. Um, items one and two are presentations, Purple Heart Proclamation, and a partner's presentation with Florida Dream Center. Um, items three, four, and five will be pulled and put to another. Uh, they did contact Harpen Springs. They're, they have no issue with you uh, postponing uh, those um, those three items so we can keep, if you're with your concurrence, we'll keep the location here um, uh, for next Tuesday. Okay. And then we'll postpone those three items. Do we have a date certain on that yet? Um, August 24th, I oh. have the advertisement in okay. hand. Okay, for these three items that need to be advertised? Okay, Correct. thank you. Okay. Um, item number six is a resolution adopting the 2021 uh, Community Redevelopment Area Policy. Uh, these are the um, modifications to the criteria for any new or extensions to the CRAs that Evan briefed you on previously. Uh, so this is just adopting uh, what was previously discussed. And Carol's here to answer any questions. Evan will be here and give you a brief presentation reviewing those at the meeting. Um, Item seven is um, citizens to be heard. Um, items eight and through 10 are items of the clerk and circuit court. Items 11 and 12 are reports received for filing. Items 13 through 16 are miscellaneous items for filing. Item 17 is quarterly report of claim settlements for April 1 through June 30th. Uh, Barry. We had um, gotten a report from the Attorney General's op or IG's office on that I, it's not on here. It, this is regarding, um, I guess we got that report just a week ago. Correct. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I have to look and when that will be, will that be on the 24th or? You haven't, you haven't received their items yet. So whenever they put it into the oh, system, okay. then it'll come to you. Okay. And um, staff is prepared to address that with the commission. Okay when that occurs. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, item number 18 is a ranking of firms and agreements with Applied Sciences Consulting. This is for um, the Klosterman Bayou Watershed Management Plan. Um, th this is for $349,946. Item number 19 is a ranking of firms for professional engineering services. Uh, this is for environmental and stormwater engineering. The eighth high, eight highest ranked consulting firms that are listed below has an upset limit of $1.7 million for each firm, a total of $13.6 million over the five-year period. Item number 20 is an award of bid to Kosterman Bay and Universal Controls for a five-year contract. This is for flow meters, parts, repairs, and calibration, uh, recalibration services in the utilities uh, department for an average total or, or a total estimated expenditure. It's a, this is for a unit pricing, but a total estimated expenditure of $9.7 million. Um, Barry, um, is, is Kelly still here? I'm not seeing no, it. she's okay. not. I was just, uh, when, you, when I saw the meters, I was thinking about kind of an update on the reclaimed water uh, well, that would North be County. Megan, but yes. Um, Megan, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and we'll make sure Megan's at the meeting to answer your question. Is this going to be relating to that? Do we know? Is it, or is this just? Uh, this is this is normal repairs the okay. way I read okay. the item, um, but okay. I would have to okay. ask Megan. Yeah, just getting an update on that reclaimed. Well, yeah. Della, will add, we'll, we'll ask her, okay. and if she'll be at the meeting, she can certainly give me an okay, update. Okay, thank you. Item number 21 is an award of bid to TLC Diversified for Sanitary Sewer Pump Station Repair and Improvements. This is for um, fiscal years 21 through 24. Uh, average annual expenditure of $2.1 million, total of uh, 6.3 over the three year period. Item number 22, uh, this is from BTS, award of a bid to Five Rivers IT Presidio Holdings. Um, and their network solutions and rubric backup solutions for hardware, software, and services. A uh, total of $731,000 uh, for a total five-year expenditure of $3.6 million. 
Item number 23 is an award of bid to the Centennial Contractors, Harbor Construction, Johnson & Lacks uh, Construction, New Vista Builders. Uh, this is for uh, what you previously saw and we pulled off the agenda. This is for our job order contracts. Uh, what we did is we pulled out all of those big items that I was uncomfortable with, and so now those will come back to you as single items. Um, so this is, through, this is for smaller projects or under our normal job order contracting um, uh, program. And these are bid, these are bid by unit price, and that way if you're gonna paint a wall, you take the square footage of the wall, you apply the pre-bid price, and there, that way you can move quickly on projects. Item number 24 is change order number two for Kaminga and, <laughs> geez, I would not be a good MC. Um, Roosevelt's for the Pinellas Trail 54th Avenue Drainage Improvement Program. This is a change order contract um, adjustment of $22,528, uh, revising the total contract to $3.257 million. Uh, small change order. Item number 25, we briefed you individually. This is the fifth amendment to the contract with Paramedics um, Logistics of Florida for the requirements for ambulance services. Uh, this is, as we brief you individually, would make adjustments to their contract to address for um, changes necessary to keep qualified staff um, on board and be able to meet the terms of the agreement. And we'll have a presentation on that. We, we will have a presentation Great. on that. Thank you. So under item number 26, this is a request to uh, authorize uh, the filing of a lawsuit uh, against the party referenced. This is a case that was investigated by the Office of Human Rights, uh, where they found cause on an alleged housing discrimination on the basis of disability. Uh, under 27, this is really the placeholder that we've put in for redistricting. I have nothing to report, but you will be making your selections for the redistricting board later in the agenda. Item number 28, I'll have a county administrator's report. Part of that I'll have Kelly here to provide you an update on Red Tide. Um, she's been doing just an amazing job uh, in response uh, to the Red Tide situation. Um, Jewel, on the, on the redistricting, um, um, maybe we could just chat a, a bit about the kinds of things that we're allowed to do under redistricting, what we need to do this year and then you made a comment last time that we could do things on future odd numbered years. Um, just trying to make sure I understand uh, that. So we might not, we, we could conceivably do nothing this year and then do it all in 2023 or do parts of it this year and parts of it in 2023, depending on what they come up with. Um, would, would that mean if, if there's some things that they want to deal with later that the the group would then, um, I guess, sunset until they re met or met again two years uh, from now? Well, I mean, I can look into that. That's not something that I had considered. But, you know, basically the state statute that um, defines the redistricting process for local government says you have to complete it in an odd numbered year. And that's all it says. Okay. Um, just from anecdotal, you know, stories I've seen out there, it does seem that other local governments. I don't know that, that I could say they didn't complete their redistricting in, say, 2011, um, but I have read some stories of others doing additional refinements throughout the decade, presumably in areas with high population growth, um, where, where the districts could get out of whack over that 10-year period. Um, but I can, I can be prepared to talk about that on Tuesday. Yeah. I mean, most of, the, most of those changes it, it, for the boundaries will be pretty minor. Um, I was, I had, when I talked to the consultant, I had asked him to just to take a look at the area between District 4 and 5 that, you know, had a little bit of meandering on the, on the border for reasons that were relevant 20 years ago and such. And just, but that may be something that they don't want to tackle this year because of the compressed time that we have. Um, so I just, you know, if those things can't be tackled or if the commission doesn't want to tackle those things this year, um, we could conceivably bring it back if we uh, just look into that. Cause sure, I think, certainly. Cause, yeah, uh, the one thing I would say is that because of the limitations in your charter now, you would have to have a redistricting board uh, to give advice on any sort of changes. And I'll go back and look at the, the language in the charter to okay. confirm that that's true. Um, 
I'm not sure that we could just sunset a board once it has made its final recommendation to you. Um, we might just need to say, for instance, you wanted to look at this again in 2025, you'd be looking at a new redistricting board, okay. I think. I got you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. Item number 29 is an appointment um, to the Historic Preservation Board, one appointment. Um, item number 30 is what um, Jill talked about, the, count, the appointments to the County Board's redistricting board. Uh, Barry, under county reports, are, where are you going to have the discussion about um, the things that we talked about today at the beginning, um, uh, Dr. Cho? And oh, Dr. Cho. Yeah, so I was, um, it, we, we had already prepared the agenda when all this kind of heated up, and so uh, I was just going to have him come in first. Um, and I, he wants to be virtual also, um, just out of concern and caution. So I was going to have him and Dr. Jameson, and uh, we could just take them first. And ask them to give an after update. our presentations and awards. Yeah, do okay. something like yeah, okay. something like that. Right. And um, yeah. Okay. Um, then, item thirty is um, an appointment to the Housing Finance Authority. That's it. Uh, <clears throat> did, did, does anybody, um, the cat? Maybe I'll turn to you and uh, Jewel on on item which is the uh, the um, redistricting board. We have seven selections that we've made individually, and then we also have four other ones, and there are 22 uh, choices. Um, uh, <clears throat> should we talk maybe a little bit today just about kind of the format that we want to use? Um, in other words, we, we just vote, and we need at least four people. If, if four people come up with more than four votes were finished, or is it just how would that how would that work so that we can all be on the same page? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have ballots for the choosing the four out of the 22 applicants. I have a couple rounds of ballots, um, so I had intended to pass out the ballots to see who voted for whom, sort of round one, um, then take those names and then send a second ballot around for round two because I'm guessing that all seven commissioners won't automatically choose the same um, four names um, and keep doing so until we have uh, the majority of the commissioners voting for the appropriate four. Okay. So, so conceivably we could have, um, I don't know how we, I don't know how it all works number wise, but um, we, we, if we don't have, if you don't have four votes the first time around, you get three people with four votes, but we don't have, we have somebody else that has three votes and then two votes, and then do we just take that fourth person with the highest votes, or do we vote again to make sure that everybody gets at least four votes? I'm here, I'm seeing it, Jewel nod. It is my understanding that we need to have a majority of the commissioners okay. vote for each person, so I would need at least four votes for one of the, one Whoever of the candidates. Whoever makes it has to be All at least. four need to have at least four commissioners okay. voting for them. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, Commissioner Justice, let me go do we, do we have a copy machine here in this building? Because I, I think you're going to need more than two rounds of votes for that kind of selection she process. Has three. I, I, I have three rounds of ballots, but I have thought about maybe printing <laughs> some more. Yes, thank you. When, <laughs> when we were going to do it back in the other, in the courthouse, I knew we had a printer right behind us, so I knew that wasn't going to be a problem. But yeah, I think I think two is uh, incredibly optimistic, and I, and I love that, but I don't share it. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, Commissioner Gerard. And I'm just wondering if we should move it earlier on the agenda. So, because you're going to be counting forever, <laughs> and we might have to visit it several times. So, and another option you all could and maybe would like to consider is to help you on successive rounds of votes is perhaps eliminating from consideration those applicants who received no votes in the first round. Can, can we take, and successive can rounds, we, obviously. Can we take a ballot with us now and fill out the first round and bring it to you at the meeting? No? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. I, no, we're not. I we, don't have them with me, oh, so okay. I apologize. And, and, and the ballots are in the, the, the it's a part okay. of the materials, so, so you can certainly look at it and maybe treat it like a sample ballot, like okay. you would if you were voting you. in an election. Right. You don't want us to fill it out ahead of time. I got you. The formal vote. Um, all right. Um, usually, you're usually very optimistic. Not, not, yeah. 
incredibly optimistic. I'm also really <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Anything else, uh, anybody, uh, before we adjourn? Yes, Commissioner Gerard. Just one little thing. Um, for those of you who might have known uh, Matt Craig, who was our former city manager in, in Largo, he passed away last night or this morning, I'm not sure. Actually, his wife, Shirley, had passed away the end of last week. So, oh. yeah. But I don't have any arrangements yet, so, yeah. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Peters. Um, I would just like to uh, wish the U.S. Coast Guard their 231st happy birthday a day early. So tomorrow they'll be celebrating 231 years that they've been serving the United States. Um, Commissioner Peters, you weren't here at the July meeting, correct? And where were you? <laughs> I thought we might want to at least acknowledge the fact that you came well, I don't think it came back differently, but, you know, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, 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 uh. Yes, I was on a wonderful uh, adventure, a month-long adventure with my uh, boyfriend, and mid-trip, mid, mid -trip, we decided to get married. So, um, Congratulations. So, thank you. <laughs> awesome. and, and no, I'm not moving to Ohio so we can dispel those rumors, and no, I'm not changing my name. So, yep. uh, And yes, I'm up for re-election, so, you know, all those rumors can just go away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What? Well, yes, Commissioner Flowers. Congratulations, by the way. Yes, congratulations. I was jealous of those pictures that she was showing, <laughs> vacation pictures. Um, idea, just throwing it out there. It's a little early, but we have had a number of our local residents participate in the Olympics and, in fact, medal in the Olympics. So um, I just wanted to throw it out there. What do you guys think about when they get back and get settled and whatnot, we reach out and um, honor them yep. here I at one of our idea. meetings? I thought that would be so apropos. Yeah. 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 That was on the that was kind of on the radar, but I, thank you for bringing it up. Oh. Um, so I think that's great. I think it's a super idea. And like you said, they got to get back and get kind of mm -hmm. settled in. But um, I'm Great idea, Commissioner Flowers. Yeah. yeah. And um, <clears throat> just so you all know, I've, my family's had a tough little time. Um, I had a family member who I'll be speaking at their funeral on this Friday, and then my daughter-in-law's mother passed away last Friday. Her funeral is on the 14th. So um, if you're trying to reach me and I don't respond right away, that's why I'm just kind of busy helping with those things. And then a super shout out to the teacher of the year yeah. from Pinellas County Schools. So um, we just have a lot of good things happening. I know we've talked about some other things that have been kind of dreary, but those are just some some positive highlights, the Olympics and the yeah. fact that um, we have a teacher of the year from our very own community. Yeah, I think it's always good acknowledging them here if we can. So mm -hmm. I'll take that and consider that uh, the last person you mentioned as well, see if Thank we can you. get them in. Did somebody? Yes, Me. Commissioner Gerard. And then Commissioner I just, um, not to bring it back down again, we'll have to think of something happy. <laughs> We've gotten an awful lot of um, emails about uh, evictions and, you know, what we can do as a county to <clears throat> slow down or stop evictions, but I think it might be a good time to review our, the program that we have and also to look at it. You know, when I look at those reports, I can't understand half of it. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense to me. So maybe we could have somebody come in and talk about that and the eligibility and the fact that it's still available because I think people don't know that. I think they think it's all gone. Um, so. I don't know. Um. Barry, those monies that were available for, for rent, um, were they also available for mortgage, uh, Not just just rent? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd have to get Aubrey to give you, oh, here comes Bill. Uh, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program is only for rent. There is a federal program that provides mortgage assistance, but that's through the federal government. Okay, okay, mortgage assistance. And we do have a link on our website to help people navigate to that program. Is that mortgage assistance also for the building owner that could be behind on mortgage or just for individuals who have mortgage issues? I'm not familiar with the details of that. Okay. But on the rental assistance, as you know, we have a program, so does St. Petersburg. It's one place, one filing, and we have money available. 
Um, and so, you know, they, and Aubrey gave you a, a new update this morning um, on that. It, could we, Bear, Bill, could you find out about that mortgage as, assistance program? Uh, maybe just shoot us something or where we can look, look it up. And sure, I, I just was curious about the folks that have had renters that have gotten behind as well and putting their mortgage at risk. And so how can we help them? And maybe we can't. Maybe we don't have a program like that. Or well, maybe the new program will have that kind of assistance. Well, um, this this program is very specific, uh, and, and we've had we've dealt with those about we can't give it to the landlord, um, you know, and we've had a lot of those things. But I could certainly have Aubrey send you an update on that, or even have her here on Tuesday if she's available to give you a firsthand account, and also tout the highlights of the program and how to access it. Yeah, yeah, I'd prefer to have her here so she, people can see that. And, yeah, you know. Directed I'm sure she's. Wherever. I'm sure she's listening. So yeah. she'll <laughs> Thank you, be Aubrey. adjusting her her calendar accordingly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I don't want to confuse it either with other other programs. I just. Yeah. I, I do think there are there are rolling issues with mortgages, and then and then small landlords that have maybe ten units. Right. That have four or five of people that are having issues, and they you know do they have a relief outlet? I just that's I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll have okay. Aubrey here. Great. Thank you. Did you have something? I'm sorry. I did. Yeah. Um, I sent Mike, please. I sent an update. Uh, Janet. I sent an update to you, Mr. Chair, and to Barry, uh, further expanding my thoughts about when you had asked for some subject matters to be discussed in future workshops. and. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, while I did want to dive further into the resiliency and sustainability, I was more specifically interested in, uh, and if any, work is being done as it relates to the tremendous heat index that certain parts of our country are beginning to experience and how that affects our health and our economy and our transportation issues and and just our society as a whole because I've read a, a, a several really pretty um, anxiety ridden articles about how it's beginning to have an effect and the other thing that I thought we might want to at least have a conversation about and I, I learned this factoid in our recent trip to Alaska, which we were celebrating our 44th wedding anniversary. No small feat there. <laughs> Sorry, Rick. <laughs> but um, congratulations, Rick. Thank yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously. <laughs> um, the amount of water that melts from one day off of the glaciers is enough to entirely cover the state of Florida. And so I actually have pictures of how visual it is to see the glaciers retreating and this one enormous glacier in just two years has totally retreated and now all it is is uh, volcanic dust and earth. It's really sad. So those are things that I think, you know, also relate to the electric vehicles and the gas tax and how critical it is to reduce our carbon footprint. All of it, it all kind of fits together when we're having these discussions that we do. And I didn't want to leave that part out. So thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. Anybody else? Yes. Just, just one point of clarification. I thought I heard you all say that you would meet here through the end of the calendar year just to make sure that we have guidance for staff who's preparing those advertisements for future hearings. Yes. Um, yes. Until further notice. Okay. Well, that yes. covers us at least that's through December. The plan. So. Yeah, that's the plan. Okay. Um, uh, and then if things change as dramatically as sure. they have this past month to the good, we'll see. Um, and keep in mind, I mean, as we do these, we need to probably make a decision one way or another for at least a few months so that we yeah. can get those public hearings advertised and well, not have the issues we, with When canceling. we did that at the end of June, I thought we were doing that, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> apparently we weren't. Um, so we'll, yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. The plan will be to stay here through the end of the year. 
play it by ear. Um, anything else? Okay, this meeting's adjourned.